Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast and welcome back to a slightly makeshift but COVID secure, or as COVID secure as we can make it, studio. Apologies if the uh, the audio is a little bit more echoey than usual, but it's the best we can do and it's to make sure that we can keep bringing you this, which is the third part in an epic trilogy from none other than Alan Blair himself. Our welcome, mate, again. Thank you. Look at I'm me. back. I'm like in a big coat, mate. You're just in like a little fleecy top. You look presentable, it, I'm double hooded. <laughs> I've got second skin bottoms underneath these. I'm all right. Nice. All right. So we've done two parts, which have been absolutely brilliant, mate, and really well received. So thank you to everybody who's watched or downloaded those. Now, this part, the sort of final, as I've uh, alluded to, is going to be based pretty much solely around urban banks. We may touch a little bit on your banks. Um, for you, I'm going to get. I'm going to say that you've enjoyed them, but I know they've been just general nice chats, haven't they, mate? The two previous episodes? Yeah. Oh, I've really enjoyed doing them with you, mate. Really enjoyed doing them. Um, it, I've enjoyed them when we've got here. Yeah. The, the lead up to it, I'm like, I don't want to talk about myself for three hours or is it really that interesting? You've been very reassuring, mate, and it's been comfortable doing it. Um, the feedback's been lovely. Massive thank you, everyone that has sent me a message. Um, yeah, but we, t- we touched on this before with regards to filming and stuff, and I'm never going to listen to them. So no. I can't remember what I said. Can't remember last week. Can't remember the week before. Uh, interestingly, yesterday evening, uh, I was working on the laptop. Chloe just finished preparing homeschooling. It's probably about eight o'clock or something. And she's put it on yeah. the, the second episode. And she's like, should we sit and listen to it? And I've just, I was kind of busy, engaged in work. And I've just looked at her and said, I couldn't think of anything worse than sitting listening to myself now and to be fair she clocked it as three hours and she was like yeah let's give it a miss but she, she didn't listen to it either she has i don't think so mate like, why, why would she sit and endure three hours of like <laughs> she when, knows it all anyway why like, would she want it recorded when she yeah. can have it live she, she put emmerdale on and it really was peaceful <laughs> as i continue to work like so yeah. nice yeah. so as i said we're going to look at urban banks mate mm-hmm. and we're going to start at the very start so for you well, how did that concept come to life? Um, yeah, this is probably the hardest one for me. Yeah. And, and I said this to you at the time. You were adamant. No, we're doing Urban Banks one. We do. Why it's so difficult for me discussing this, or certainly big chapters of, of what I, I know you want to talk about, is you guys have seen the films. Yeah, do you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? Why am I going to sit here now and talk about... But, you know, there's other things that you want to ask and stuff. But, yeah, for me, this is quite a weird one, like talking about Urban Banks, because... It has been so well documented in yeah. terms of the actual films and other interviews and this and that. So I'm sitting here now thinking this is n- dreadful, you know, <laughs> regurgitating stuff that they've already watched and stuff. But to answer your question, mate, and we touched on it, I remember in the first one, my upbringing um, mm. was village based, lived in a village, went to school in the city, city in the loosest terms, Milton Keynes. Yeah. I don't think it was deemed a city at the time, but it was urban, you know, and I was. Um, in the early days, mum would take me um, and she'd work quite close by and then I'd walk quite a distance to get to my schools. Um, as I got older, um, I would get the bus in myself and stuff. So I had this kind of like, this two-part life, which I think I, I explained, I would look back on now and very grateful of, you know. Yeah. So yeah, those early years, I was urban fishing. I talked about the Milton Keynes Park Lakes. After school, walking back to mum's work, I'd always have gear in her car on a spring summers afternoon go and do a bit down on teardrops which was a series of four park lakes um fond memories of like opening of the season i don't know if i'll discuss this but we would like steal borrow a shopping trolley that would be our barrow all the gear would go in there and so i kind of grew up doing it to a degree uh, maybe not to the extent I've done in, in later years, you know, like really going into the thick of big cities and crazy places, Amsterdam, London, Paris, etc. But it it just was a kind of natural thing growing up and it's always been there. Um, so when I started working at Nash, yeah, I was still doing it. Yeah. You know, it was kind of still what I knew if there was a, a local venue, whether that be a bit of river or a, a not so much here, canal, um, park, lake or whatever. Mm. It was somewhere I still enjoyed to fish. You know, a lot of people, funny because we just had the same conversation with Tom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, A lot of people listening to this might think, I can't think of anything worse. You know, you're laughing at Sam. I won't say what you said. <laughs> um, it was I'll tell him. Politi- <laughs> so what was your description? My, my experience of urban fishing... 
And there's been various different experiences, sort of as a kid on canals, absolutely fine. Cut my teeth there, like happy days, no problem at so all. So you've got your dog walkers, your cyclists. Yeah, that, your, I yeah. can live with that, yeah. absolutely fine. My last experience of urban fishing, which is circa like six or seven years ago, I was taken, taken being the operative words, to the Keys in Manchester, mate. And I wasn't ready for kick out time and the madness of like people being sick on your brolly, trying to nick all your gear and just not being able to really relax. Yeah. Um, fish was amazing. The fish that are residing there are amazing. The angling is different and amazing. But for me, <laughs> the whole scene is just, it's not what I go fishing for, if you know what I mean. Uh, uh, and that's, it's, it's a really interesting observation because you are talking about the top end yeah. of the scale of it. And I think it's important, you know, let's take a step back. What is urban fishing? Yeah. What is urban banks? And it can be what you want it to be in in that respect. I've always looked at it like that. You know, it's very difficult to pigeonhole anything. Yeah, you know, totally. I, it may be slightly easier. Well, I'm a caster. You know, I only fish. You know, forty wraps, forty five wraps, whatever. You know, I'm a floater angler. But I think when you talk about like, I'm an urban fisherman. Mm. Where does where do you draw the line? Yeah, if it's got one bin, is it urban? No, no, no. I often think like this, mate. Yeah. You know, when when does it become country park and yeah. not park lake? You know, does it have to be in a city for it to be? A, I've fished some urban places in tiny little villages, like that. You've still got a tramp there. You've still got the park bench. You've still got <laughs> rubbish. No, yeah, it's, it's something yeah. that I'm con. Like what? When when does it become urban and when is it not? You know, so. I think for me, growing up, I just went fishing. Yeah. If it, if the park lake was good for fishing, I'd go there. I didn't go there because I wanted to be urban. Right? That's where the good fishing was, you know. And I think people growing up in certain, or people living in certain areas, it might just be the best angling that they've got on their doorstep kind of thing. And yeah, some people therefore fall into that, getting used to it. It's what they know. It's what they enjoy and, and they embrace it. And so, yeah, at Nash, it carried on, mm. you know, this urban fishing but not like oh yeah I'm going to do urban fishing this it was just that was a good place to go fishing that I like the stock for example or I like the venue or it was quiet a lot of this boils down to peace and quiet yeah and getting away and being able to pick a swim based on where the carp were which is something that again we discussed this last time I quite quickly realized that yes yeah, it's, it's so cliche but if you turn up somewhere and it's already stitched up and you can't get on the fish. I'd been through those years of mm. doing that, going through the motions of fishing shit peg, shit areas or whatever, and seeing very little reward for that. Yes, I made lots of mistakes myself. You know, we talked about blaming the bait last time, maybe the wrong rig selection and that. But to be honest, a lot of the time you just weren't getting on the fish. You know, whether I'd have angled epically well in that situation or not is, is another question. But I just didn't feel I was getting on them. And Going down a local bit of canal, going to the park lakes and stuff like that, I just felt I could fish on my own terms a little bit better, which is probably the reason I did continue to pursue it, you know, mm. in, in more recent years. Um, so back to the original question of urban banks, and I've said this so many times, it couldn't have been more organic in terms of, you know, if we sit nowadays and talk about um, film production, creative ideas, concepts, we would sit around the table we would bounce ideas around you know venue choice um, the type of anglers to appear uh, maybe the tactics that were going to be covered uh, almost storyboard it to a degree yeah. you know but with that particular very first episode of um, banks it just couldn't be further from the truth no you no know, really you know yeah and in terms of integral players you obviously, as a concept, didn't come up with it no. with regards to that. It was Winston and Ollie who were pretty. So I know Winston didn't even work for oh, us. Oh, was he not? Was uh, it? Sorry, Ollie didn't even work no, for no. us, mate. Um, so basically, this was an era, and this just literally walking up these stairs a minute ago, mm. I was doing a timeline in my head. Yeah. We're talking like 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Yeah, so yeah, to yeah. put it into context, you know, guys, if you imagine like nowadays, there's six uk videographers there's uk uh, there's videographers in every territory there's media managers there's social media managers in the space of just a decade how much marketing has changed within within the angling industry we talked about it in the last podcast or the one yeah the last one i just used to look at magazines and make sure the ads were in there mm. and stuff and now it's a big thing you know so if we go back to the conception of 
Urban Banks, as a company, Kev, you know, because he's always the one noticing, you know, he made an observation pretty much then, 10, 11 years ago. He's like, the next big thing is going to be in households. Everyone's going to have a smart TV. Therefore, we need to really jump on this YouTube train. We need to be producing videos. We need to be hosting on YouTube because, and I remember him saying it, you know, in the not too distant future, people will be going home from work, sitting there at the weekend. They'll turn their TV in and they'll be able to watch you on YouTube. Um, pre this, we had some form of some angling on TV, but mm. it was you know few and far between. This was like the, in the boom, certainly in angling anyway, of of fishing content available, and yeah. we were behind a tad, but we were probably still further ahead than most companies. But yeah, conscious effort decision that we need to start producing more fishing content um and that's where winston came in mm. uh, amazing bloke absolutely amazing um really creative very very talented non-angler you know it's worth no 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 i don't I, I can't comment i can't remember but I, i'll go as far maybe never picked a rod up in his life kind wow. of angler um but just raw talent for for editing and and editing's one thing but you need to have that creative side as well, all that ideas, all that vision, all the imagination, the dream, and he, and he had it all. And I started working with him at the time. Rich Wilby worked for us, you know, oh, Rich. Yeah, I know so Rich, yeah. Rich, he's now up at uh, up at his lakes and that, having yeah. a lovely time. Um, I'm very, very fond of him still. And uh, he was brought in as a journalist. Okay. Because this is still where mags are massive, you know. It's yeah. all about getting that content in those mags and... Um, yeah, if we had someone in-house shooting those features, it would therefore... We've discussed this, I'm sure. Yeah. So Rich was brought in to do that. But yeah, this is exactly how it went. I've gone out to shoot a mag feature. Yeah. I've gone with Matt Downing. We'll come back to that. But me and Matt, because we were fishing together a lot back then, we've just gone out fishing together. Um, I'm trying to shoot this mag feature, which is why we were there. But before going, I vividly remember uh, Winston saying to Rich, look, do me a favour, just... I think he was using a 5D, yeah. turn it to film mode and just try and capture something, some yeah. of the moments. And, and that's what happened, mate. Matt and I went to the Grand Union Canal, somewhere that the pair of us had done a lot of fishing on mm. in years gone by. This is pre-Nash as well. And we just literally went for a, for a night. Um, yeah, you find it very funny watching it back. I loved that, it, mate. Yeah, I can't, it, that's what it was. It yeah. was, I needed to shoot the mag feature. That was the important thing, yeah. getting that done. Um, Winston asked Rich, could he just film some of it, which Rich obliged. Rich was, he's obviously was conscious as well, the way the market was going, having come from a magazine background yeah. himself, you know, times were changing quite rapidly. So he embraced that, started filming. And yeah, I, I got home, went back to work. Rich got home and went to Winston's and dropped off this footage. And the next thing I remember is this video landing on my desk with like, graffiti titles and yeah, yeah, yeah. bass driven music in it and yeah. I'm like I'm just like wow yeah. like not wow but like it was just typical Winston yeah you know it could have like, it could have been a down the canal gonna do some fishing <laughs> Rosie and Jim nah mate he's gone in with a graffiti and the and it was launched yeah and People really liked it, like, and that was the very first episode. And the name Urban Banks, Winston? Winston, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Winston, mate. the concept, Winston. I can't believe Rich Wilby filmed but it, mate. That's that's Wilby crazy. filmed it all, yeah. So, we, uh, you know, we just went to, um, I'm just trying to think what we caught. We had a couple. Yeah, you had a, had a couple. Yeah, you did. You were fishing tight across Amber Strawberry with yeah. the boilies, weren't they, mate? It was a, the, the stretching question. You know, the Grand Union Canal varies a lot mm. in terms of stock. You've got some of the stretches or some of the pounds um, where, you you know, match clubs, tring anglers or Luton, they've stocked them with carp. Then you've got the other stretches that may well have been stocked many years ago and they've just got a smaller number of fish but better fishing. And I remember that particular stretch, it... I'd add 20 pounders from there before. It had form for, for better fit. It weren't one of those where you'd get yeah. a number of, of yeah, bites. Yeah. It, it was renowned for some better fish. Um, and yeah, we caught a couple. I did some bits to camera. Yeah. It would have been one of the first times, not the first, but it was, remember I mentioned last time about the very first time the Box Logic film in. Yeah, I that do. wouldn't have yeah. been too much further in front of all that. So it would have been one of the first times really I had the camera in front of me and was in the loosest terms, trying to present something or at least explain, I'm here today, I'm doing this, let me show you how I'm doing this. And What and was it like with Downing on camera? He's a, Matt, he's a 
bloody bloody. Matt, oh, Matt, I love Matt so so much. Um, Matt nowadays doesn't go carp fishing anymore, and he probably would agree. He might not. There might have been other factors, but a lot of the reason why Matt probably doesn't fish anymore or carp fish it is because of me. You know, like a lot of the lads, yeah, he just he ain't him out. had enough, man. Yeah. Like, and it, it's a shame, really, because he's he's a shit hot carp angler. Yeah, he, I wouldn't say he bores him out. He he did a, he does time to get his bites, but in comparison to the other anglers on any water I've ever seen him fish, he can catch him. He can catch him for sure, and he's got a really good photo album. Yeah. Um, but not anymore. He's done with it, mate. He's like, LRF now, isn't he? He's he got right into the predator fishing yeah. and then he went LRF and, and he's still doing a bit, you know. He, he still loves fishing, but I think too many sessions with me in shit weather, you know, sleepless <laughs> nights, driving here, there and everywhere. It, he might disagree, but I have to probably take a bit of blame, if not all <laughs> the blame. Um, was that one of the last sessions? No, we, me and Matt went on for many years fishing together. Yeah. But yeah, Matt... Just, just have got fond memories of yeah. sessions with Matt, like real fond, especially on the canal. We did a lot together on the canal. Cause yeah, because we're talking, this is around about 2011, I think, when this first episode's come out and been packaged mm-hmm. to you and then gone gone live. Mm-hmm. In terms of your fishing then on the canal, mm-hmm. when watching the episode, there was a little bit of that old course influence mm-hmm. and maybe a little prelude to bushwhacker baiting poles with mm. you cupping bait tight to the far margins yeah. and, and sort of catching them there mate yeah. do you remember any tackle specific that you were using or anything like that? that's quite a long time ago mate not really mate it would have been again you yes. guys watch this probably know it all better than me but i would have thought i was using a white bait yeah, whether yeah. that be uh what would it be back then like um it's amber and strawberry I was it amber strawberry yeah, okay a bait that i used for many many years and loved a lot and yeah. Yeah, it was that classic, you know, they're canal fish. They will know exactly what bread is because yeah. of the canal boats. And yeah, for, for many years I've used, I never didn't use a pole, you know, because I've always had a pole. Um, I've just made sure like the, the pole cups had additional foam on the bottom to mm. support the weight of two or three ounces of lead. So it, it was just a natural thing for me to take the pole canal fishing to be yeah. able to ship tight to those far banks and stuff. Yeah, nice, mate. And at this point when that first episode's landed on... After that, the feedback was, I'm guessing, pretty positive. Yeah, like, I can't remember, but it was positive. Yeah. It wasn't like we put the video up and everyone was like, this What's is this? shit, yeah, like, yeah. this is shit. And so, yeah, it was, it was positive enough for for us, you know, me and Winston and Rich and to go, let's do another, mm. you know, let's do another. And when you think back, it was pretty radical. Yeah. In terms of... Yeah, I, I don't want to make the statement, but had any fishing films ever been done like that before with that kind of music? Yeah. And, you know, it's probably a bad example and it, and they get better as they go on. But certainly, you know, those first few episodes, I don't think a drum and bass track had been used in, in a fishing film before or... No, mate, it was very you know. much the opposite. I mean, I, I was researching this before we, we chatted. I've, I've literally watched them all, <laughs> mate. So I watched... The first one, at the time, you're looking at, like, videos in 2011. <laughs> it's your quintessential, like, la-da-da, we're going angling. And that is, like, completely, like, the other end of the spectrum. I could imagine that that, that is either going to do one or two things. It's either going to be embraced because it's different and brilliant, or it's going to be completely, like, what is going on yeah. here, boys? Like, ridiculous. Yeah, Almost probably. ridiculous. But, no, it, it was well enough received that we decided we'd go and... Uh, uh, and make another one. Yeah. And then episode two, Rochford. Yep. Now, yep. like I've heard, even in the office now, you lads do a bit of time on Rochford because it's close to the office. Yeah, and it's, it's good for a bite. It's 15 minutes away. Um, the next one was, I think Rich might have left now. Okay. He um, basically went to fulfil his dream and uh, made a massive, and that was running his fisheries. Mm. Um so it's just me and Winston, I think. Did Ollie work for us? If he did, he would have been there. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It was just me and Winston on that show. Yeah. Um, we would have seen the, loosest term, success of the previous one, decided to run with it now and make a second one. And it, I remember the planning lay, like, lying on my lap and stuff, and, and rightly so, Winston wasn't a fisherman. He was like, what do you want to do? And, you know... It, Make no bones about it. Like the reason we have to make, not have to. The reason we make these films is because we want to sell gear. You know, yeah, I, I love yeah. the YouTube comments from everyone. Like where they're like, oh, "Just plugging." Yeah, that's kind of why we're doing it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> um, did, Kev didn't employ me to make lovely fishing films. Yeah. He employed me to. So yeah, that's why we're doing it. So it's like 
what do we want to promote? What do I want to promote in it? What do I want to include? Mm. But also really conscious that I wanted it to give the viewer knowledge. And, and so I thought, let's go to a park lake. Let's, let me give people my thoughts on what to look for, you know, how to approach it, what I use, and hopefully I'm going to catch one and hold it up. And it's that classic, that is what a fishing film is, isn't it? Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. there are some deviations in that, you know, but at the end of the day, you want to give people a good bit of knowledge, explanation, it's informative, um, it inspires, it's aspirational. You know, there's, there's a number of different things I'm always conscious of anyway when I'm going away to film something. Yeah, totally. And yeah, that was that. You know, we're going to go to a park lake. Remember doing a walk around or introducing it here at Rochford, doing a walk around, looking at these key areas where there might be carp present. Mm. Um, I then cracked on it sort of got dusk i think it was early spring if i recall yeah, yeah winston right. went home for the night i stayed on my own um caught two or three can't remember and winston came in the morning and we sort of filmed those fish went through what i used how i caught them yeah done a little bit of stalking float fishing and, and that was episode episode two you know the, the rochford talking of the venue it's a very different park lake now very, yeah yeah f- so different back then um it was Certainly in this little catchment area, it was one of the places to be, to go. Right. It had like proper anglers fishing it in terms of some of the boys that work for National fished it back then. Kurt, for example, it had one 30 pounder in it, a true lever. Did it? Yeah. It had a fish called the redfish, which I did see once. I'd never fished it, by the way. I You'd never fished no, it before no, this no, episode? No, no, no. I certainly never done a night on it. Wow. At the very best, I'd walk around it for an hour of a rod just to see if I could nick one out of the edge. And that's when I did see that redfish once. Okay. But it was, in, in terms of park lakes, yeah, I'll say low stocked. You know, mm. I don't know exactly. People would be better informed than me, but let's take 30 to 50 fish. And how big is it, mate? Like three acres, right, okay. something like that. So it's not low stocked in terms of there's half a dozen carp in there. Right. But it weren't, like now we're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fish in it so wow the, the, the lakes changed a lot from from back then and, and it appealed to me back then i don't know why i didn't do more time on it yeah um, probably because it was relatively busy a bit too busy for my liking in terms of you know there was lads on there they wanted to catch this yeah. big lever they wanted to catch the redfish and there was a group of anglers on there that were you know fishing it it was like mm. a, a proper little lake yeah know, so to speak. yeah yeah so you, your opportunities to move and get on them were obviously yeah so more it more never it. i was never like you know but then that was me it still is me i didn't want to keep going back to somewhere and i certainly wasn't that hell bent on catching this lever you know not that i was going to go and spend time and time and time again trying to catch no. it but it's a cool little park like yeah, and some bites and a success on, on, yeah. on shoot too. Yeah. So again, ed- editing wise, Winston's edited Winston, all that up, yep. kept to the same theme of of sort of that urban graffiti sort of craziness. Yeah, and, and ran with it more now. Yeah. You know, it, the thing is with Winston, it's probably worth pointing out um, that we were quite similar in that he liked this. We liked the music. We liked that whole right. the trainers, the urban, the graffiti. You know, the whole. He, he grew up in the hip hop era, so it, he just liked that. It, it, it naturally it worked really well together in point yeah. of view of me being the angler going and doing it, and then the guy filming and editing it. Yeah, it was like we gelled in that respect yeah. because we had similar or common interests. Even though he wasn't a fisherman, he kind of took some of his love of just general lifestyle or the urban scene or whatever, which. As get, you get it as that urban link, isn't it? Yeah, uh, and it was like you've got someone who likes fishing that kind of venue, but also likes the trainers and the music and the graffiti. And now you've got an editor and a filmmaker who, yeah. and it just worked. You know, it worked. We would get excited together, like, and it's around this point, you know, that Ollie joined, which just exacerbated that, you know, yeah. tenfold. Because Ollie's the same. He loves his music. <laughs> he loves. He grew up in London, etc. So it, it just does, worked man. as a as a group of people, a collective. Yeah. Yeah, how did Ollie come into the fold then? Um, so what was number three? Was that so the number river? Three, uh, number three, you're on the River Crouch, okay. weren't you? Which so is now, yeah, cute Ollie, uh, big love, I'll missing you loads. Um, yeah, Ollie's joined um, exactly the same as Rich. So we probably lost Rich because he okay. went to fulfil his dream. Yeah, yeah. Had to replace Ol. Um, sorry, had to replace Rich, replaced him with Ol, brought Ollie in. Um, great decision, you know, been best friends ever since. Um and yeah, Ollie, much like Rich, it was kind of, 
you know, more maybe more so than Rich. When Ollie joined, it was like, Ollie, you're going to be shooting features and stuff, but yeah. you're also definitely going to be filming. You right. know, so Ollie knew from the start kind of thing, whereas Rich was appointed just as a journalist. Yeah, yeah. Ollie was like, you know, he knew he was going to have to be putting that, that camera on to record and stuff. Um, and yeah, I'll come out and we did that that River Crouch shoot, which so, was the third one. So did you approach Ollie or Ollie? Because Ollie's working for a publication at the time, So isn't I it? was working for DHP. Um, yeah. Again, I've definitely tough. Sorry if everyone's heard this before. But basically, Ollie was fishing up on the church um, with DHP. It was like a corporate session. Okay. All the guys from DHP come up. Um, and yeah, I... Basically, I don't know if I'd even met him before that. Possibly not. Gone up to see him. Kev come up. We see him the next day. Um, and I think Kev really warmed to him um, because he, it was around the era that we we're developing the zig bugs and stuff and doing a lot of testing with them. Well, Ollie okay. already had a box of flies. Right. Um, that, you know, he'd, some of those he'd, he'd had tied onto car hooks and stuff. And Kev was just like forward thinking angler impressed. You know, he was fishing Horton and him, yeah. them two got on really well. I think that's probably how it worked. And Kev come down to me and he's like, you should go and chat to this lad. Like, because, and I just went up to chat to him and like, we talked about like drama. Bay. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing about fishing at all. Yeah, no, I was aware, you know. Yeah. So, and yeah, we just got on really well and um, we needed someone. And we offered Ollie the job and he, and he accepted, you know, fair play. Um, so, yeah, he came out on that, that third episode. We went to the River Crouch. Um, Was that the same bit of the river that you got flooded off I with? wondered if you'd make that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's exactly the same bridge, everything. Not even the same river. It's exactly the same location. Right. And what had actually happened was... That morning, we went to Northlands Park, which became the fourth episode. Yeah. So we've gone, to, I've still got the photo, actually. We went to Northlands Park, like, it's typical me, you know, I still do it to this day. Kev always goes to me, have you looked at the weather? No. <laughs> no. And I don't, Hassan. Do you I've, not? No, 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 no. Which is an interesting topic in itself in that I never, ever look. I can't believe that, yeah, mate. Yeah. I Honestly, thought you'd be no. studying it, like little no. pockets. The, po and the polar opposite. And I had a really good talk with um, Mike and Joe Morgan recently yeah. or just before Christmas about this this whole topic and I referenced Ollie in it and Jamie Klossick another one who you know these lads that they live by the these apps and the percentages and the moon and the mm. whatever I couldn't be any further from the truth so I'm I'm basically work on the basis if I've got a day allocated to go fishing that's the day I'm going fishing deal with it you you'll know, make it work which yeah. is, well I'm not saying I will make it work but yeah. I do the best I possibly can in that situation. We're digressing here, but with regards to Joe and Mike just before Christmas, it was a really tricky night. It was freezing, freezing cold. And we just pulled off a venue and gone to another venue. It's about 11 o'clock now. I've gone through the process of getting the rods out. Didn't cast any till I see shows, see three shows, three rods, light leads, little zigs, bang on them. And I was so happy with the way I'd angled my choices by not just casting them out. I just felt... And we sat down and had a bruise. It's well gone midnight now or whatever. And we got onto this conversation and I don't know why I did it, but I was like, go on then, tell me what the percentage is. Yeah. So they've got it up and it was like 13%. And it just deflated me, Hassan. Mm. Like I felt I'd angled well. And then just what a mobile device told me, I was like, oh, this is fucking yeah. shit. Like I'm peeing in the wind. So yeah, basically I'd, I've lived my angling life not looking at the weather. If I, if I had a really flexible lifestyle where I was... I did, didn't have anything to do other than potentially go fishing, I'd pick and choose. I'm not daft, do you know yeah. what I mean? And I'm very aware, you know, certain conditions are much, much more favourable than others. But yeah, I, I just go when I can go. So Fair this play. particular morning, we've gone to Northlands Park, which is a, a series of two lakes, two little park lakes, three acres and two acres, might be a bit bigger. Um, and um, yeah, we got there and it was like, you know, getting on for an inch thick, completely covered in ice. Oh, beautiful. So, um, smashed a bit. I've got, I remember picking the photo up and there's just a photo of me of a totally frozen lake behind us. And again, this is typical me. I probably, I will have had a busy week. Yeah. I've got Winston and Ollie with me and I'm thinking, well, let's go and do it somewhere else. And mm. they probably like laughed and said, look, how, look at the fucking lake. There's, yeah, what are you doing? And then I remembered, said little spot on the river crash so it was totally unplanned they weren't yeah. like this is plan b or we probably never would have thought of doing an episode of urban banks there yeah. it was purely because it's now whatever time in the morning pretty early nine ten o'clock or whatever yeah. i've built myself up all week i've got excited because i'm getting to go fishing and we're going to make a film and now i'm like 
and we are going to go fishing and we are going to make a film today and we went to to the river crouch um yeah which is basically again this is goes back to the how urban is this because yeah, if yeah, you look totally. left and right it's just fields yeah yeah with the odd horse in and but the particular bridge yeah there's graffiti all over yeah. it and smash bottles and so yeah. it goes back to that original thing at the start is only you can decide whether you feel it's urban, urban whatever yeah, yeah. urban Your is you know what i mean like, urban. i've just wanted to go there because it, it it was enough to make it an urban banks film yeah. and it was a good spot. Yeah. You know, I knew that Carp lived there. I'd caught plenty now by this point. Um, and it, it was worth a shout kind of thing. So I remember thinking the first episode being quite amber strawberry commercial orientated, but obviously urban bank has. The second was, was very much about you just fishing Rochford, mm-hmm. uh, different tactics used within that. And then, Come into the, this episode, and I think majority of it, you're tying up a different combi style worm rig, I think it was in the end, mate. So a couple of questions on that. The sort of commercial element in these three is was, was quite heavy. It's quite pronounced. For you, I know you changed venue, but was there still sort of, uh, I don't know, a primary concern around education of how to fish a river and <coughs> getting some product in there? Yeah, of course. Like yeah. I said, it's always been a, a, a conscient, you know, conscious thing that I'm not just going out to make a look, I can catch carp, here's a lovely yeah. film. I've got to try and do it for the best of the business. It's always been that reason. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you know, in that instance, I was like, I suppose what I was thinking was people have watched one, they've watched two. The people that have watched one and two are likely to watch three. So I don't really want to show them what I showed in one and two. Mm. I've got to try and pick something different. Mm. Um, As an angler, I'm looking at the situation. You've got carp living in a tidal river that no one else is fishing, with the exception of at very best you could count them on one hand, yeah. maybe, but I never, ever saw another angle. You never saw anyone? Ever, no. never, Hassan. Not, not, not even, no, never. So I'm thinking, right, from an angling point of view, are these fish used to swimming around picking up round balls? Are these fish used to swimming around picking up sweet corn? Are they picking up cubes? Of no. Yeah. You know, go down the natural route. And that was just a, a decision as me as an angler, not thinking, oh, well, I can get in something because it's you know it, you're, you're weighing it up all the time you've got yeah, to try and give the best information possible i in my opinion these fish were not you yeah. know eating boilies on a daily basis unlike for example a park lake um and i thought i felt the best chance was a, a bit of worm so. success before on on rivers fishing natural baits and worms yeah, when you're dropping you know, on? yeah it, it depends i know this particular stretch of river there's no other fish in there Right. So it's not like if I was going back to the ooze or, yeah. or wherever it is, you know, you're going to get battered by bream or perch or, or just any. I knew that wasn't an issue. Whether that was explained or, or not, in the, it should have been my fault if it wasn't. But, you know, yeah, there's a time and a place for naturals. Um, you know, now I will explain if I never did it at the time why they will work so well in here. You know, I think at times down there I was just fishing little aligners, you know, with two maggots well, on the yeah. hook with a bit of rubber. Because with the exception of the very odd eel... Yeah. I didn't have any nuisance fish problems. Yeah, happy um, days. So yeah, that's an example of where you can get away with it. But yeah, I can't remember what I used or, but it was difficult. Um, yeah, as I you'd remember, expect yeah. whenever you got this much, this much ice everywhere. Um, I think I caught one little ghost. In that's that right, mate. Right the end, the end. Yeah. And um, that was it. But, and this is something that even to this day, we, we struggle with as a company. Um, and it's why we brought Curly on, uh, on board a couple of years ago or a year ago. When you got the likes of Wynn and Ollie, man in a camera, trying to capture every moment and stuff, it's very hard to, at the end of the day, go, did you get loads of photos? You know, so what happened on this particular shoot was, uh, I'm also trying to still submit magazine articles. Ollie's trying to still submit magazine articles. I remember we did the shoot, and then a week, I think, later, we went back, just Ollie and I, and um, to shoot a mag feature. Mm. Now, it's that double handling, using your time wisely, and we're getting much better at it, i.e. bringing Curly on a shoot to not do any filming, but just Just, to rattle off photos and stuff. But in this instance, we basically ended that day with no images, Right. Um, needed to submit a mag article went back down there volley and it was really good we just went for like two or three hours and I caught three really nice ones and, and they did feature in the film I think as just cut in yeah, cut, yeah. but um, yeah I think anyone watching this or, or watching it at the time 
even to this day, I look back at those photos and I look at those car, those three, you know, uh, that week. Mate, they're, they're proper special yeah, ones, yeah, yeah, you definitely. know, and, and that's, you know, why do I enjoy it? Why do I go back? Why do I go to these places? Well, I remember like the shots, everything, like every bit of foliage is just like hairy white. It was that cold, you know, and I'd gone out in these horrific conditions with all the lakes frozen over to what most would deem as a shitty little bit of tidal <laughs> river. Like, why would anyone want to fish there? But the memory for me was, yeah. mate, they were fucking really special little carp. You know, I don't know if they exceeded 10 pounds. They might have been 8 to 12 pounds. But in February or whenever it was, you know, it was an achievement. It was mate. something I'll look back on and, and go, it goes back to that, what does a fish mean to you? And those fish, you know, to the day I die, if I ever grace a photo album yeah. and I, I'll go that was a special day man so it's well, it's a personal it's, thing but I remember in episode two you talked about personal bests and what you quantify it should yeah. be personal biggest yeah it's, it's the, the value of a fish is what is within the capture and the captor isn't yeah. it so however you deem it to be valuable yeah. it's, it's on you isn't yeah. it yeah. so they it was they were special yeah they didn't actually feature directly in the film we did it a week after but the venue itself it would throw up some little gems like that yeah. and yeah cool yeah. if that didn't go to plan, you didn't catch. Did you have a plan to, to reshoot it, to go back to the original? Because I'm guessing... That's what Urban happened, Banks mate. Falls. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what happened. So if we'd have gone out that day, we didn't do the night, so we only done yeah, the day there. Right. Let's say six hours, because it's winter, short days. We yeah. probably didn't get there till 10, 11. I don't know. It would have been a, just a short shoot. If we hadn't have caught anything, yeah, I think we would have been conscious that, and to this day, I'm still very conscious of that. We a fishing film's not really a fishing film without fishing it. Mm. Um, it's very difficult to... Um, we've just been lucky, worked hard, however you want to dress it up over the years, can very few shoots. Yeah. Very few shoots. Because um, all, all these three, I mean, that's ad hoc. You've sort of had a plan and you had to re readdress it. But the other two, they've almost... They've happened pretty organically, mate, haven't they? Yeah, like the Rochford run, went to the park, <laughs> caught two or three fish, can't remember, four fish, whatever, three fish. And... That was that. Yeah. It, it goes back to like well, what I've always said about Eurobanks. What you see is what you get. Yeah. You know, I didn't much. go back to Rochford afterwards to like squeeze in an extra carp or to get a bigger one to put in the film or anything like that. Yeah. We went, we shot it, we caught, we launched it, you know, and this a Crouch one was exactly the same. The only difference being we did slip in some still images at the end from yeah. a, a session from a, a session. week later. Yeah. How would things change in terms of obviously Ollie coming on board and you having now essentially two cam camera people? Mm -hmm. How did that change things in terms of filming? It, it, like easier, more more content? I don't know. What what did that change anything for you actually not, doing not, it? I don't recall it. It would have certainly changed for Winston. I he's now yeah. got a right hand man, so to speak, and he's got a second second cameraman and. But no, I don't remember anything really changing in that respect. We would have in the loosest terms a, a plan. Yeah. Although this one, we had to completely change it. And we just went and tried to shoot something. Yeah. You know, we're still learning, you know. Yeah. I'm certainly learning. Ollie was definitely learning. And I suppose Winston, because he might well have shot a number of films pre-coming to Nash, but he never shot anything fishing based. So we were all learning. Well, yeah. I, felt, I fell in it together, if that makes sense. It wasn't like I had a really forceful cameraman who was the boss or it yep. wasn't like yep. Ollie had a wealth of experience so he turned up as the boss we would sort of be like in it together yeah yeah, yeah. in terms of like let's try and go and make a film for Nash today and that's what we did like yeah nice mate uh, moving on to to episode four so we've come up to 2013 here. Mm -hmm. So what's featured before has been preceding that. 2013 you've gone to to Northland Park in Basildon I yep. think it says here so Basildon mm -hmm. mate have you been there before? Because no, obviously Rochford, no. you just rocked up. Are Again, I hadn't... Up? Yeah, well, it's my life. That's it's my life. I hadn't fished it before. Um, I spoke to Russ, who was... Uh, he had the lease on it. Okay. Um, so he looked after it. Russ said, no problem to go and film there. Did I know anyone that had fished it? Not really. He hadn't spoken... No, it wasn't like I could draw on any kind of information. Yeah. Um, would I have gone and had a walk around it? Absolutely. You know, I would have gone to just how safe is my van <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Um, how safe is just the lie of the land just because i'm not really probably even been to basildon let's be yeah. honest like you know just so engrossed in work and that but it was the venue the, the venue was picked probably on the basis that decent stock um yeah. you could night fish it been in contact with the chap russ lovely guy he said no problem to film there 
let's go there then, you know. And I remember going, I think, I, I might be wrong here, but either Winston or, or Ollie, it could have been both, but I've got it in my head, it was just Winston. They come and met me there in the evening. Okay. The sun was literally just almost gone, you know. And we did one intro, like, hi, it's Alan Blair again. <laughs> yes. And today we're down at Northlands Park and I'm going to show you how to catch fit. that classic intro few shots walking around and then it was the goodbye thing you know that winston is fair he went daft why the fuck would he stay out yeah. of, of northlands park you yeah. know in a shitty cold this was february again i think so it's freezing cold yeah i remember yeah um so yeah i was left down there on my own to fish um i i i think i think it started really slow for me i think there was like no bites forthcoming yeah. quickly yeah and i think what i did was I basically, like, probably that time I went for a walk round, I just assess the situation, like any angler would. If you turn up at a new venue, what's in front of you? Right, there's a bird feeding area there. That could be a shout. You know, wonder where's the deepest bit. Well, it kind of looks like it's stream-fed because there's a real narrow bit. I wonder if there's an old river bend. Maybe not. Mm, what is, is there any big overhangs? Mm, not really. All the willows are kind of off the water. It had one predominant feature, and that was a really big red bed of rushes. Yeah. Um, pre this, this is like the, when I'm really spending huge amounts of time with Kevin. He's given me all the knowledge in the world. He basically informed me how important cover was in the winter, how don't get so hung up on always looking for the deepest area. The fish are going to be where they're most comfortable and want to spend the most amount of time. So I can remember assessing this situation as an angler, where would I be? You know, and that's something as fishermen we should always be be conscious of and doing. If I were a carp now in fucking February, <laughs> I'm not going to be slurping bits of bread off the top of the yeah. bird feeding area. Where am I going to be? And I, I just was drawn towards this huge set of rushes. Kevin also explained to me like this radiator sort of concept in terms of, on those sort of cold winter days, you can still get some bright sunshine. We had one day last week that was glorious. You know, if you stood out of the wind in that, it was proper yeah. nice. And basically, if the sun will radiate onto woodwork or onto rushes, there's enough there in that matter to br to retain a little bit of that warmth and just make the fish feel comfortable there. So hadn't had a lead around. Didn't know if it was deeper no. or shallow anywhere else. I'm just going on this concept of where would I be if I was a carp? I'd be at those rushes. So I picked my swim, which basically gave me access to the middle bit of rushes. Started fishing, the little choddies. Yeah. I'm well up to speed now on my choddy fishing. I'd had my Jim Shelley lesson, had my Jerry Ammon lesson, had loads of discussions with Kev about it. And I'd sort of, I won't say mastered it because it's far from the truth, but I'm conf really confident in the tactic now. It was all about putting that breaking it you know to stop the rig coming down and i was i had previously been dropping too many fish to hook pools and by separating yeah. the hook um to the lead and stuff anyway so i'm now ch really happy with my trolley fishing unpack that then mate so you're separating so you've got a little bead yeah, just a, just above your lead or something when i when i if we go back to the college and the estate lake if yes. you remember the estate lake was really silted up and it lended itself perfectly to the to the choddy but i'd say on average 70 to 80 percent of the fish i hooked fell off Oof, right. and i always put that which is dreadful you know absolutely yeah. appalling never cracked it at the time it was only spending the time with kev afterwards that things started to make sense and what i believed it to be was you're talking like maximum two foot of water right not particularly small fish they're upper doubles low 20s and i think i was fishing always fishing to the far bank because the noise or whatever would push the fish away so it was always far bank fishing so you're talking retrieving a carp 50 60 yards 70 yards maybe back across this very shallow estate lake and the fights were always pretty head shaky they were they you know they had nowhere to dive down and, yeah. and deeper so if, it was like bringing a walking a dog on a lead kind of thing you're kind of just bringing them back across the surface they go a little bit to the left and right but a lot of it was just you know that head shaking motion and yeah. my chodrig was sliding all the way down to the leads and i I'm speculating. So much of fishing is speculating, but what makes the most sense is that just on a particular head shake with three ounces of lead, or it was, it was, you know, taking the hook out. Anyway, talking with Kev a lot, I started to. I think the first thing I did was like splicing. I'd take a ring swivel, cut the swivel element off to leave me just the big ring. Yeah. 
splice that in and then I'd splice another section of lead core because leadless is cling on you know it's yeah. the bollocks that weren't around back then so it's still lead core um, and then what did I do I started like threading rig tubing down on string and needles okay. so I'd put like a, a section of rig tubing and then a, a six mil bead yeah. above that anything basically to stop that Going we ended right up you know there. now we yeah. sell a product we sell three different kits Chod kits for fishing, naked, sliding, or on um, uh, on leader, like lead core or cling on. Um, and it's great. You know, you've got these little mini boom sections yeah. that they add a little bit of potential shock absorption on the battle. Um, uh, they keep the hook point away from the lead on the cast, so you yeah. never run the risk of, you know, your hook point going into there. But most importantly for me, they just create that little bit of separation. Mm. And anyway, we digress. I'm, I'm using the choddy still and... Yeah, I think what happened over the course of that night was I, I adopted that little and often tactic. I th- I felt the fish were deep in the rushes. Right, so I couldn't them fish yeah. deep in the rushes. Yeah. I needed to try, and so it was kind of that plop, 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 hoping, and, and yeah, it really kicked off. I'm going to use that word. For a February session, yeah, it, yeah. it kicked off. In the night, big group of lads come down in excess of like 20 lads, and... Um, they're all getting beard up and there's just me on the lake. There's no one else fishing. No one else on the lake at all? No. Um, and, um, yeah, they come really close and there's fucking road cones going in and bricks. And I went over and had a chat with them. And you went over to a group yeah, of 20 good lads? Yeah, good as gold. Really? Just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy, lads, kids. You know, oh, I would right. have been older than them. Oh, like, okay. You know, I don't know. It's 11 o'clock at night. They're 16 years old, 17 years old. Just like, yes, boys. Like, have a chat with them. Like, I beg you do me a massive favour. I like... Just fuck up. No, I didn't say, <laughs> just, j- j- lads, please, mad yeah. favour. I'm just trying to catch a carp and it's winter, it's freezing. Cut. And I think when you can talk to people on some kind, yeah, for sure, they could have just weighed me in. Yeah. Like, they could have done. But when you're just polite and you're just asking, lads, please, man, I, oh God, I really need to catch a fish. And yeah, good as gold. They left me alone and, and that was that. And yeah, in the morning, Winston and Ollie turned up. I remember having a few couple of nets in the water with fish in and there might have been the odd sack with a fish in and yeah 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 there's nothing there's no greater feeling you know this Hassan you've done a lot of filming there's no greater filming than having some in the can it just the weight off your shoulder you know that first fish mate is like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it it? is massive you know anyone who's in that situation you know there's all if I go fishing there's always a pressure to want to catch yeah. the last thing I want to do is go home and the girls go to me how'd you get on daddy <laughs> yeah I blanked again like yeah 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 it's, it's dreadful isn't it or you go back to your parents or you go to your wife or your schoolmates or whatever you went fishing yeah I didn't catch anything wow 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 it's shit isn't it yeah. well it's even worse when you've got a film crew there <laughs> so I was buzzing that morning you know yeah. I basically got them lined up a few nice ones glistening white Let's make episode four, um, Banks and Orphans Park, yeah. Yeah. We talked about the choddy very quickly. In terms of the separation element, that improve, I'm 70% losses, so I'm guessing it improved it up to to at least 89% success. I don't drop it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, me now, For me now, you know, I I try and think, we say like, what's changed? What's the difference? What's made? Nothing really. You know, I'm still using similar hooks to a degree. Yeah. It, it has to be something to do. I, I'm, like I say, I'm speculating so much here, but I imagine this scenario now, hooked fish, mm. tension on, so that's pulling this way. But if at any point there is any element of slack in there, I've still got the lead underneath keeping everything in, whereas before the lead was up here. Yeah. And if maybe on a, a slack moment, I don't know. I, like I say, I'm speculating. Which, All I can say is... I'll drop a fish on a choddy as much as I will on a yeah. short, whatever rig, yeah. you know. If losing the odd carp is, is part and parcel. Yeah. Um, and it's not 70%. No, mate. It was bad, Hassan. Bad. It was really bad, you yeah. know. And it could have been the way I was tying him. It could have been. But I think f- the biggest change was putting that piece of separation in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And now you're happy. Don't don't change it if it's not broken. Mate. No, I love it. You know, and a lot of people, they look at the product. I loved it when we launched it. You know, it's classic, like... Just not keyboard warriors, but people like 
Yeah, but look, look, it's, there's a big bit of silicon there. The carp are going to see it. Yeah, but the nature of the rig, you know, it's fished into chods, into silt, into silkweed, all weed itself, you know. The carp, it's not like I'm fishing a polished gravel spot, mm. you know, with a great big bit of silicon laying next to my rig. It's a chod rig, and I fish them sliding, you know, so my rig's now well away anyway, and... Yeah, I, I love you it. You always it's fish them sliding as well, mate? I do. It's an interesting discussion. Um, I think if I was the angler going back to a venue and time and time again, maybe a syndicate or regularly fishing a park, like if I could ascertain, which I would be able to, that mm. the, the silt was only, for example, very shallow, it was a, a light layer of silt, or conversely, it was very, very deep, then I would be more inclined to probably lock it to a degree because I think you'll get much better hooking potential. Yeah. But for my fishing... Turning up somewhere, usually blind, usually in the hours of darkness. I'm relying on doing my laps or listening or spotting something. I just want a rig, and this is why I still use it so much to this day. That rig, I can see a show at 40 yards, for example, or a number of shows, and basically with one cast, I can be fishing. And I could choose then to put all three rods or four rods or however many rods in that zone where those fish are showing, and it's a single cast. And to me, that is a massive thing, massive thing. When I might have to be going to work in five hours from now and I've got a small window to try and nick a bite, do I get a braid rod out with a lead? Do I look for a spot? Do I want good... Pre- no. Do I just want a rig out there fishing? And that is why whatever anyone says, if people listen, if anyone ever says, yeah, they're for noddies, chods are for nods, or or the rig's blown, or, or any of these things. Yeah, the blown thing I kind of get. If, if you're on a syndicate and everyone's battered them on a choddy, I wouldn't be using one either, you know. But for the bulk of my fishing, I'm yet to find something mm. that you can put the hard work in, which is always the location, and then in effect, and I always say this, I can turn my back to the water... I could just pub chuck it out there. You can. You can, yeah, you can, you mate. Can. Do I even need to feel for a good drop? No. You know, it's just it's yeah. a very good rig. So. Yeah. At this point, do you remember baits at all, what you were fishing? I think uh, for some reason I got it in my head that it was still amber strawberry, but you've watched it. Yeah. I don't know, all, but I also white, think tootie. White. Yeah, yeah. I've also got orange tootie in my head. Yeah, um, it was classic it was winter flavour. Yeah. Flavor, um, but yeah, it was definitely small as well, probably worth taking note. Um, the venue, it gets match fished. Um, so you, I'm talking about like that it'll either be one with a bream bag or it'll be one with a cart bag. Yeah, so yeah. I knew the stock of the fish, you know, was somewhat different to Rochford, which was like a carp yeah. park lake. This was more of a, a general pleasure park lake. Um, yeah, I wanted a small bait, little tit bits, you know, like just enough to get a bite, that classic, it's winter, don't fill it in and yeah just use the catapult remember just little and often like three baits at a time for example over the area where these choddies were fished um they just must have been enough to coax them out yeah and, over time yeah it was probably one of the first episodes that sort of showcased if you like a bit of interaction with the general public yeah with regards to people who are non-anglers who are just using the park for we'll say recreation for looser terms yeah is that something I mean, that's definitely something that a lot of people don't like, but it's something you seem to embrace, especially even in these early days. For you, is that is that another draw for fishing places like that? The fact that it's lively and things are going yeah, on? Yeah, 100%. You know, I can't think of anything worse than, for example, tomorrow going, you know, down to a the River Chelmer, for example, where odds are on, I'm probably going to see no one all day. I'm going to be alone. I'm going to be cold. I'm going to probably be miserable because I've blanked. That doesn't really appeal to me. No. Whereas if I go down to a... Lo- okay, shit situation now with COVID, but pre all of this, if I go down to my local park, like or my local canal, even if the fishing's not on, someone's probably going to cheer me up or conversely, I'm going to cheer someone else up just by engaging. You know, has something like that. It's not something that has... A culture, I don't think we're very good at it. I think there's other countries in the world that are far better at it. But I've always kind of, I wouldn't say been brought up, but if I walk past someone in the morning, mm. morning. Yeah, definitely. Is is there anything wrong with that? Did I make that person maybe smile? Did did that make them just... Do you know I, what I mean? So I'm in, I'm in this situation where I'm freezing cold. It's not really fishing very well. And I can just either bounce back off another member of the general public or try and make their day by just engaging with them and talking and... 
Yeah, I've also always been quite fascinated by other people. Have you? Not really, not to the point that I like. Yeah, but if I'm getting yeah, if I'm getting the train, you know, into London, it's a Friday night. I'm going to go party in. I'm always like just not stare, but you look around and think. You look at what someone wears or whatever, and you feel. I wonder what he does. I wonder what she actually does. You know, just intrigued. You know, and the park often will give you that. People are using it as a by route to get to and from work, or yeah, I just think. It's just nice to chat to people, especially on a shit, miserable fishing day, you know, so I've embraced it. Fair play, mate. In, and also, I think for you, looking at those scenes, but also being with you when people are, have come around, you're very, not pro-angling because we're all pro-angling, but you will almost go a little bit out of your way to sort of share that, that passion that you have with others. And yeah. I think regardless of what it is, if somebody has that, passion and they'd share it and it might be something that you have no connotations of at all in your life i think you can't help but buy into that in one aspect or another like yeah. i really think it's quite infectious oh, i've it? loved the time some of my greatest memories have been the times when you know people have i remember liverpool i caught this one particular fish and i remember this lady saying like she's jogged around here for 20 years or something every day yeah, she didn't even know there was carp in here and she's like in awe of this creature, like absolute. So I've caught it. I'm buzzing. It's a good and whatever. This has happened hundreds of times, by the way, more thousands maybe. But when you see the reaction of someone else, you know what it's like when we catch a fish. Yeah. How happy it makes us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now imagine that someone's spent their life living by this park or what. They didn't even know these things were in there. And now they're in that moment going, oh, 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 oh. you know, that's like fucking wicked. Like that makes me really happy that you've made someone else happy. Like it is, there's, it, there's the opposite side of it. That's, yeah, that's what I was going to touch on. That. Yeah, there's the opposite side of it. But but how do you deal with that then? Because obviously you can't pick and choose You what can't comes pick and by, choose, mate. but that's life. You know, that's life. Uh, you have to deal with it the best you can. You said there with the lads, you were like, you were quite, I mean, it's not, is a bit of a ballsy move going up to a bunch of lads, even though they might be a bit younger. But you you seem quite good at being able to sort of roll with the punches and potentially diffuse anything that might be... Do you know what I mean? Because I wouldn't want to... I don't know, if I was in that situation on my own at a place I hadn't fished before and there's a big group of lads chucking bricks about, I don't think I'd have gone over there and said, excuse me, lads. You've got, you got to look at the situation. There's a load of lads hurtling stuff in the lake but they're kind of moving my way or bits are coming closer to me one could have buried his head in the sleeping bag and prayed it <laughs> but i'm thinking you're ruining my fishing here man like <laughs> you're ruining my fishing and i've got a film to make so what do i do do i stay like now i know because i've been a little shit myself to a degree i'm not saying <laughs> i would do this but all it would have taken for them to get a little bit more excitable and one go to the other one, let's fucking throw one at his fucking umbrella. Let's throw one at his umbrella. In that situation when you've got, there's the peer pressure element. Yeah. If one of them had thrown one but not quite landed, the next one would go, I'll fucking get him. So I'm just trying to defuse the situation before it, because that's what I think would have happened, possibly. Yeah. They would have got more and more excitable. They would have like got bored of throwing things into the water let's hit his tent yeah let's hit his tent whereas Brilliant. if i just get out and you know it wasn't like i just got out i just i'm probably wearing similar trainers i'm talking yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. the same lingo like yes boys you good like what's happening like and they're like it's kind of stopped them yeah yeah yeah. so now you can engage with them and you just you just you know most people in this world hassan are reasonable yeah most people, even though those lads were at a few beers or whatever and they're throwing shit in the lake, if someone didn't, if I'd had got out and started screaming at them yeah, or yeah. God, who the you little shits and all, they would have probably retaliated back tenfold. I didn't. I just was like, yes, lads, oh, I couldn't do me a massive favour. Like, I'm desperately trying to catch a carp. It's February. Like, you know, any chance you could just lay up like, throwing shit in around here and that. And they've just gone, yeah, sorry, pal. Like, sorry, bro. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> fair play. Yeah. You ever had anyone that's like, you must have had some people come by that are just completely like, I can't do anything here. Well, you no know, the Bristol feels. lady, oh, you know, we, got, we, we come to that, but no, not really. No? Not really, mate. No, not so much so that I felt really intimidated. I'm yeah. talking 
groups of lads and and stuff like that. I've never felt unsafe, but again, we touched on it in other areas. There's been any time where you do feel out of your depth, you know, the particular time in Rome with Ollie, where mm. we were by, me and Ollie, we looked at each other and we were like, nah, let's go. You know, when we were in Paris, we took us hours to find somewhere safe to fish on the River Seine. You know, so you've just got to be really sensible, mm. you know. And I, I say again, not trying to go over. If I'd have got out with a bank stick to that group of kids, it would have ended badly. 100% would have ended, but not from me, like, weighing them in. I would have... I, <laughs> it would have ended hero. badly. <laughs> no, I would have ended... Yeah. It would have ended badly. Yeah. It would. I think also, you know? it, sometimes, especially to, like, people who are non-anglers, it is a barrier, isn't it? Some bloke sitting in a tent mm. who's, like, in the winter, you just think he's a bit of a weirdo. Yeah, like. yeah, possibly. Yeah. You know, and that's what I'm getting at. They could have started to... Th that train of thought could have come in, and it would have just took one of them going, go on, fucking throw it at his tent. I, I know the situation myself yeah. from being a kid. Like, yeah. throw it at his tent. Go on, I dare you. Throw it at his tent. And they would have all laughed and then the other one oh, I'm going to throw something bigger and yeah I just wanted to try and knock it on the head before it potentially went I need to way. put you back on the keys mate and see how you deal with it and then I might go back <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> so that episode's concluded it's very successful it's um, great yeah uh, in terms of catching fish but also in terms of I think watching it a more sort of Urban bank style rounded mm -hmm. piece it had a bit of everything in yeah, it. Yeah, we're four episodes in now. Yeah, we're yeah, two yeah, years yeah. in. Winston's like properly found his feet in terms of making fishing content. Ollie's now definitely much more proficient at mm. filming and capturing the moment. You know, I say again, it was the three of us. We gelled well together and we were proper good mates. And it was, it was never a hindrance. It was never a no. chore. It was just like, we're going to go and try and make another episode of Urban Bank. So obviously, you want to keep it going. You want to keep regularity mm -hmm. in terms of content. And these are sort of biannually. Yeah, there's a couple of episodes. It seems to be a winter one and a sort of a summer edition yep. each year. Now, is the planning and everything and the idea and the concepts around venues and what you wanted to cover still all based with yourself? Or is it is it more of an open chat with the three of you or, or does anybody else get involved? No, not really. Not not In terms of that question, no. Like We would have been like, let's make another one. Yeah. Okay, I'll go and have a think where we're going to do it. Okay, let's do it here. That's it. You know, I pick. I, pick <laughs> I love Northland. that, mate. Yeah, well, it is. It's like, <laughs> yeah. I picked Northlands because it was close to home, and it was winter, and someone told me there was plenty of little match-sized carp. And probably Steve O'Rourke, I think. You know, yeah. he runs the manor. He would have mentioned it. Someone mentioned it, and then when we went and done it, what was the next one? Stratford upon Avon, mate. Okay, so again, that now we've gone further afield than Essex. Yeah. Um, why Stratford upon Avon? Shakespeare? No. <laughs> No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely Urban Shakespeare, Bank, Shakespeare. Um, uh, Why Stratford upon Avon? It's a good question. It's a good question. I would have probably have been tipped off that there was some yeah. decent fish in there. Yeah. Uh, it's a canal I hadn't fished. That might have excited me. Um, but I cannot for the life of me think, you know, it wouldn't have been Winston's influence. I don't think it was Ollie's. I can only imagine someone i've been at a show maybe i'll flick through carp talk something would have influenced me to want to go and do it there mm. i think i remember the opening sequence vividly mate is you on a bike getting yep. about yeah, as you yeah, say yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's a, a network well, so you're only in your canal so it's massive in yeah. terms of the whole stretch for you did you have any idea about the stretch you must have had some intel with regards to to Again, I, I can't there. remember, like, I can't remember of an individual, but there would have been some influence yeah. because it is a bit random, isn't it? Like, yeah. you've gone from doing a few in Essex to all of a sudden now wanting to go to Stratford-upon-Avon, but I can't for the life of me remember. I do remember, however, so it would have been February, March yeah. time, doing the Northern Angling Show. I remember leaving, I'd done my slideshow, so it's like two o'clock in the afternoon. I remember getting in the motor and then having to drive home and knowing that in a few weeks' time from then that we were going to go and film this, so I stopped off like, on my own. Uh, I remember it was snowing quite a lot. Mm. I was really poorly, like really? just run down and, you know, yeah, really quite poorly. I remember speaking to Chloe saying, um, I think I've probably gone for my walk or whatever. Basically, again, trying to ascertain where's, where can I park. I yeah. found a Premier Inn hotel. That was, you could park there. Had a little look at the stretch and... Probably was supposed to jump back in the motor and carry on going home, but had my gear. And I remember ringing Clay saying, like, I feel real shit, babe. Like, I'm just going to stay here for the night. 
And yeah, I did. I just crashed out on the canal, f- um, flicked the rods out and did a night. And uh, yeah, got the fights all snow and white and yeah. didn't catch anything. You know, didn't catch anything. I remember it was a really s- pretty sleepless night because I kept getting woken up like every hour for just by random weird people, man. Like oh. just, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really quite... It weren't, a, it weren't a problem, but I just felt poorly and I just wanted to get a bit of sleep. And I basically just pushed myself a little bit too hard or yeah, whatever. Yeah, I worked yeah. too much, blah, blah, blah. Um, and yeah, I just wanted a good night's sleep. Probably not the best place. To, there was a fucking Premier, Premier Inn. Inn <laughs> yeah, but that's typical me. I, I'm thinking, well, I might get a bite. I might yeah. get a bite. And yeah, it basically, I think this was a good, a good run, let's say, for people to move things and it was just a busy bit of canal with traffic of people and I'm not talking about your average dog walker or such this is like midnight onwards what's that all about I don't know mate but yeah I got up in the morning um, hadn't really learnt a great deal but I did (laughs) know I did know where I could park the motor yeah, and yeah, we yeah. were due to come back. You You'd know. have known that without fishing though. But I like. would have passed and that's <laughs> fucking typical. <laughs> that's um, yeah, and we went back up there again, trying to think, you know, what different dimension can we add into this? How mm. can we make it slightly different? Um, brought the push bike. Um, it was probably more of a hindrance than, a, than an asset. Um, so much so that that push bike I purchased for that shoot this really? Is, yeah, this is a true story. So it's only a cheap bike from Argos or somewhere. Did you spray it up though? It looked pretty right. decent. No, I don't think so. Did you not? No, I think it was exactly as I bought it. And then that push bike was never rode again until the summer just gone. you joking. No, no, not once. <laughs> not once. <laughs> Edge. So I bought it. I didn't put, didn't, Nash didn't buy it. Like no, no. I bought some fucking random push bike to go and make that. Thing and it never got ridden again until you know on the on that topic they are you know when I used it this summer yeah I was in France oh my god it was a godsend Hassan and you know it, it off the back of this trip just gone in the summer if I could if I could fit it in the van oh mate they are wicked you know for for getting around and checking areas and if, you know j- just to take instead of walking hundreds of miles you know you can use push bike the only other time I've used a bike with any kind of success was bled, you know, where yeah, we had yeah. the bikes there. But other than that, you know, Ollie's taken one with him a couple of times when we've been away and done things. When we're filming the social with all the boys, they're useful for the videographers. But if I'm honest, I'm definitely much prefer sawn off net, small pouch, or I love fishing off the barrow. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's nothing better than angling well off the barrow it's much better than angling off a push bike let's put it yeah, like I that i can't say i've used a push bike especially when i was a kid pre-baiting it was brilliant because you oh, used to just go yeah. straight down as a kid load of pre-bait straight in a spot yeah. and then done but actually rods and like carrying gear yeah i'd be terrible i'd be in i reckon i'm terrible on the bike mate but yeah so within that same episode you um the bread bombs featured so you've caught a few is sort it of, yeah mate okay. so you've caught a few on the old bread okay. bomb so for you, that whole concept, because it is a massive concept to now. I mean, I've caught fish on the bread bomb. It's a, it's a yeah. good, really well-selling product. Yeah. But it's part of fundamentally in terms of your angling. Yeah. How did that all come about in terms of the development of it, putting it out there? Yeah, Obviously, so nothing to do before. with me. No, 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 not at no, all. No, 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 nothing to do with me. It's a, it's a how politely, it was an elderly gentleman or an old gentleman, lovely oh. gentleman. He came to us with an idea and um, Kev really didn't want to do it. Um, but he's always been so good at listening to others. It's not about just what Kev wants or just what Alan wants. I was like, nah, Kev, man, like it's got legs, you know, fishing with bread, you know, it can be problematical in terms of it's not like putting a boilie on a hair rig that will stay on there for 12, 24 hours or longer. If you put a bit of bread on, especially where you've got lots of rud, for example, that are just, you know, moving that hook bait around or desperately trying to, you know, and I could see the advantage of a, such a product. And Kev basically, like he's done so many things, give me his blessing and said, look, if you really want to do it, you want to give it a go, then let's try it. And the gentleman to this day is earning a royalty from it, which makes me very happy that, you know, he gets paid, you know, well for a, an idea that he created. Um, top idea, man. Yeah, top idea. You know, top idea. And good from Kev that he's accepted it after, like, yeah, maybe not initially. Yeah. You know, do I use them all the time? No. No. If I'm looking, if I can get a quick bite, 
Um, I can mount a bit of bread that will stay on there long enough. But mm. nine times out of 10 or 99% of the time, if I do want to retrieve that bit of bread, I've now got to put another bit on. Yeah. Where that's the difference with a bread bomb. You yeah. don't, you know, I can retrieve that bread and sometimes I can get a second or yeah. even a third cast in. Yeah. Um, so absolutely fantastic product. And, and yeah, it's only if the fish are, the only time I wouldn't use one is when they've been hammered on bread hammered on the top and they are properly scrutinizing everything you know that's when you have to drop your hook hook, uh, hook link diameter your hook size all of those little edges mm. to get them to suck one in it's at times like that where sometimes they do look at that latex band i know what they're thinking yeah fuck <laughs> no ch- yes, and, and, <laughs> yeah right you know that's the only time i wouldn't use yeah. one you know a lot of the time it's an amazing product especially for keeping that bread out there for prolonged periods of time but more importantly getting a second cast in yeah mate they are i, I was um i wouldn't say skeptical but I wasn't quite sure and I've used them caught loads on them there Omega um, canals mm-hmm. for you we're talking about location so obviously you you'd sort of done a recce on the stretch not really um, what were you looking for or what key features if you were going to a canal now sort of stand out for you it's, it's the same as anywhere you know you'll look it goes back to that we talked about it before in, in the previous one Kev sort of drummed into me home mm. where do you spend most amount of time assess that bit of water where are the carp spending most amount of time and it's it's classic things they're looking for cover you know if you've got one big set of overhangs or one big tree or di- it's i just don't want to bore people but they will be where they want to be mm. you know it was a hard lesson for me to learn this hassan because having spent so much time fishing the rivers and canals for the carp in my earlier years i got too caught up in where i thought they wanted to be yeah um, and that would sometimes be potentially a classic tree in the water, you know, and I'd look at that and go, yeah, they're going to be there. Actually, they might not be there because just 100 metres further up that bit of canal is an area that's a foot deeper than everywhere else, and even though that tree's there, and to the human angler, yeah, that's where they get. No, actually, they're up there, you know. Mm. It might be they're on a bend, or it might be where there's some weed, or it might be where there's a natural bloodworm bed, or where there's loads of mussels. And, okay, granted, on these um, bank shoots and stuff, it's quite difficult to quickly draw all yeah. those pieces of information. But anyone who is thinking, yeah, I want to catch one out of the canal, or I want to catch one out of the river, the best bit of advice I can give you is quickly try and work out where they want to be not where you think they want to be, you know. And that's the same applies to a lake, you know. There'll yeah, be, yeah. It's just fish will be, they'll be in areas where they want to spend great amounts of time. But yeah, if I'm turning up somewhere, I am definitely going to be checking out the cover to start with. Where is that most amount of cover? That particular canal, the boat traffic was relentless, you know, they use it. Um, so certainly in the daytime, they're going to push themselves up onto that shelf on the far bank underneath the cover. Um, I don't know if you recall, I started off on the basin. Yeah. Great big beautiful basin full of boats. Um, was asked to leave quite quickly. Um, again, not because yeah, that's really cool. I'm going to go poaching in the basin. There was no science. Like I yeah. just went fishing there because it looked like the best, yeah, yeah, and it always will be. You know, if yeah. if those carp weren't locked in, for example, and they had free access to go in and out of there, odds are on the bulk of them are living in that basin. Most amount of cover. Um, in this instance, they're getting no angling pressure, so of course they're going to be in there. Food from the boats, etc. Um, But yeah, you're looking for changes in depth, certainly anywhere that's deeper. Um, I recently done a bit with with Elle and Dave for Sipography before Mm. Christmas and I literally was catching them. There was so many boats, big boats as well, residents, they're not being moved. And I think I nicked one bite off the boats, but every other bite come off the lock mouth just because it is no more than a foot deeper than the rest of the canal. And that's it goes back to that word comfortable. Where do they want to be? Um, so yeah, there's th- that's the advice I'd give. How long would you give it? That's the question I was going to ask you. How um, long would you? So so let's say you you've got uh, ideal A one. You've got a massive marina. You can fish in there. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got loads of boats. How long would you give it in in said location? Let's say you cast between two boats before you start looking around. It, it's unanswerable, isn't it, mate? You know that. It's yeah. it, it's unanswerable in terms of you've got to read the water on that day. Am I getting liners? Well, I'm not going to reel in. Am I? Is there bubblers coming up? You know, as one just crashed and shown. Or have I sat here for four hours and yeah. seen fuck all? <laughs> because if that's the case, yeah. then yeah, I am the kind of person to think. 
no, it's not happening. Let's do something about it. And that probably wouldn't be a rig change or a bait change. Not now anyway. Back in the day, that would be exactly what I'd have done. Oh, I'll just put a different colour pop-up on or I'll just change my rig like that. Make- no, go and find where the carp are, you know. So, yeah, I don't tend to sit around for very long, mate. Um, a, because I haven't got very long, mm. and B, because how boring is that, man? Like, at least if there's bubbles coming up, you know, your there's anticipation's something. there, or if you're yeah. getting the odd liner, or the water's all of a sudden become a bit more coloured or whatever. So, no, I would be quite quickly moving. Yeah. It's taken me a long time to learn all of this, you know, but yeah. n- nowadays, you know, I'm, I'm really clear on the fact that, especially when I've got something like citrus, I've got maybe the chod rig. If I fish and I ain't getting the bite, relatively quickly they're not there you mm. know i had it just a week or so ago with dan on the park lake we were down at rochford filming a beer and i'm fishing this particular area i've seen them in the area three or four days previously i'm thinking that it's winter they're not going to have moved far so i've invested yeah. the entire morning so four odd hours fishing this zone where i'd seen shows three or four days previously i turned out that morning full of confidence because i'm thinking in my head they're not going to have veered out of this zone for example Never had a liner. And it got to the point where I really needed to catch one for this particular shoot. I've said to Dan, do you know what, mate? Like, I can see this going one way, and that is a blank. I'm going to move. I'm going to go around to the other side of this island. I'm going to fish an area that, when it had froze the previous week, hadn't froze. Always Mm -hmm. worth bearing in mind if, for whatever reason, an area like doesn't freeze over. So I've gone around there. Yeah, 20 minutes later, I've got one. (laughs) You know, and and, but you know, and I said there was two young kids down there, and I said to them, "You've got to understand, I didn't change my bait, I didn't change my rig, I changed my location." So I don't know if that answers your question, but definitely, mate. No, spot on. From this point, obviously, another good episode, um, a lot covered in it, and a bit indifferent in terms of location. You've branched out a bit, as you said. Um, as a series, did you, at this point, put any limits on regards to how long it would run for or what you wanted to achieve on it, or just continue that sort of organic process of doing more? Yeah, I think so. At this point, I'm still not really aware of... <sighs> I've got to say this in the least arrogant way. I'm still not really aware of how much people loved it. Yeah. I think I'm still going through the motions of I've got a job to do. That's make a fishing film. Um, I'm just doing a job. It's just another job. Nothing more. Um, Uh, Yeah. 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 It obviously in in the later years, I I started to realise the effect it was having. Um, But I think probably at this point, it was more a case of need to do another episode. Like nothing more. I don't think I'd really realised that people had enjoyed it so much um that's how i remember it anyway so we're like 2013 ish winston's still involved in the company what's, what's the next one the next one's bristol well no we've got urban bank six which is the euro bank sort of yeah mesh. so 100 percent win still here so Winston's yeah, still 100%, there. yeah so episode six he's still here ollie's obviously still there you've now sort of gone into euro bank so one was seven seven was bristol. bristol okay yeah so what's happened here is really mad because I had to work all this out for myself yesterday when I'm thinking about what we're going to talk about. What's happened here is, I think, I'm sure, we've gone to film Eurobanks 1, but it wasn't Eurobanks 1. There was no such thing as Eurobanks. It didn't exist. We've basically, me and Ollie, have gone, where can we make another episode of Urban Banks? Well, we've gone from Essex to Stratford-upon-Avon. Fuck it, let's go France. (laughs) No, really, <laughs> yeah, really, yeah. really, really, really. It, c- it can't have been any simpler than that. I was at the time um, influenced a lot by the likes of Pillar and Hoffman. Yeah, held them in really high regard. They were like breaking the mold as well in terms of fishing films. I don't know if you've ever seen any of their yeah, early no. stuff, but I haven't seen their early stuff. Okay, no. so they were like, I remember the one that really like hit home to me that. I love these two lads, love them, was I saw them fishing the Alps with toy boats in winter, catching big carp, like, it. everything about them, like, you talk about being inspired and, and stuff, I'd watch their films and just be like, I can't think of anything better than being with them right now. I couldn't, you know, they were, it was just fucking epic, like, yeah. and became very good friends of them, you know, Pillar was part of the Nash team at one point. And anyway, I just got on really with similar age and love partying and just, it, it, it was a good, you know, they're good people, they're good lads. Mm. At exactly the same time, you had Bastel and Nick in Austria. Yeah. 
And they were they had just done an independent production of a film called Metropolis Carp. I don't know if you've ever seen I've that. Never seen that, no. So it's only ever produced on DVD. It has since been aired on Carpzilla, which okay. is the German yeah, yeah, yeah. sipography equivalent. But anyway, so you've got Pillar and Hoffman fucking doing crazy shit. You've got Bastel and Nick who have produced a, a masterpiece for its time, masterpiece, um, where they fished and filmed in the city of Vienna. Mm. So I've kind of got these two outside influences as well that I'm like, you two, you groups, like, you're fucking cool, man. Like, And I was like, Ollie, we should go to Europe and we should go and... What was it, just the there. vibe of them or just <coughs> the fishing or the places? Ba- Bastel and Nick's was pr- proper urban. So, you know, they were right. commuting on, on the trams and they were fishing in the thick of Vienna City and oh, yeah. catching mega carp. They also um, drum and bass led. So they <laughs> had put the drum and bass in there. And, yeah. and Pillar and Hoffman's was much more the adventure thing and just like... You know, sites I'd dreamt of or seen in like Cart World articles, you know, where you've got the classic Alps with the snow on and, and there's these two lads with shitty toy boats, like fucking, I wouldn't say acting clowns because they are seriously talented anglers, but they were just two mates that had gone fishing together yeah. and it all just, that they it happened at the same time as me and Ollie going away, you know, to film what was supposed to be a, an episode of Urban Banks but ended up turning out as the first episode of Eurobank. So where there's no episode six of Urban Banks, it's because... Because it's Eurobank's yeah. one. Yeah. So how did that come to... So you obviously you filmed it, but how did it come to the decision to then call that Eurobanks? Because you just thought, I'm going to do some more of them because I love being away and, and the adventure. Again, I'm, I'm kind of like making it up as I go along here. Like Ollie would probably tell you a totally different story, but I think what probably happened was we came back from that shoot Wynn looked at the footage, mm. storyboarded it like, fuck, man, you've got a seriously good film here. There's a, this and that storyline, caught a load of fish, blah, blah, blah. And maybe Kev's influence or a, a decision between all of us. It was like, let's not launch this as a YouTube video. Let's put this on our promotional DVD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what happened. I think when it was first launched, it was only available to view on on, that DVD. on the promotional DVD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't on YouTube at that time. And it was a chapter within, you know, a multitude of chapters. Um, yeah, that was the start of, of Eurobanks. But again, like, we never went away and thought, well, we're going to make Eurobanks now and we've got to do this, this and this and this. It was like, let's go make another episode of Urban Banks just outside of the UK. And if you look, if, if you've watched it, the venues all were urban. You mm, know, yeah, we went true. to see Geo that uh what became one of the most famous uh urban belgium fishing yeah, spots yeah, yeah. we went there then we went to bruges with him which was again fishing in the city of bruges then we went to fish the river with all graffiti and, and then we went to tet to te- te- the park lake and stuff yeah. so it was all urban based in that respect yeah um, crazy how that organically miffed into completely sort of organically like i can't weird, stress it? it enough whereas now i sit with the likes of dan and all the videographers of you know we plan things and you think about the what outcome you want and where you want to go back then you know we were learning yeah we were seriously learning how to film how to edit how to present what did the but people want and it was very natural and organic in that respect so. but both are so like from from following it as a as an angler and and, and being influenced by it because you, you you have to be really if you're brought up and you go through watching it at that time, it, they're both so like so much of a definition of like the Nash direction. Mm. Without them, you just think like, what what else would you have filmed? I couldn't imagine you going onto like a normal day ticket lake or doing whatever without them. They're so synonymous with the brand. It's they're mega. It. It's easy to reflect back now and think that that was... I'd love to sit here now and say the truth is that we evaluated what our competitors <laughs> were doing. So what was Corda doing? What was Fox doing? What Right, we're going to do something... To, but we didn't. No. <laughs> we weren't that clever. It's just you though, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. We weren't clever enough to realise, look, if we go and do the same as them, then we're just going to get the same results as them. You know that classic fishing thing? If you fish like everyone else, you'll catch the same as everyone else. It, we, we weren't thinking like that. No. We weren't marketeers. We weren't thinking about how to get the best promotion. Or the, We were just like, yeah, we really like drum and bass. We really <laughs> like Airvax. We really like cool shit in the city and that. I personally, I can't speak on behalf of the other guys, I personally have been influenced by Bastel and Nick with this one production, Metropolis Carp. 
I was influenced by Pillar and Offman mm. because they were making these cool films, two mates together, and that's where it ended. Okay, we'll have a go. What was what's interesting though is as well as you said there, like those two Pillar and Hoffman, Bastille and Nick, they're European influences. Yeah. yeah, they're quite broad horizoned in terms of. I know a number of people who I've spoke to at the time who are working at brands within the UK, whose focus, if you like, whose influence, whose sort of aspirations and everything was very much home based. There wasn't much consideration. There's the odd bit of Cassian and the, and the romance of all that and people who've pioneered trips out there. But in terms of other media and other influences that have been produced in Europe, there wasn't that much. Has that always been a common theme for you, being quite open to sort of European influence and influence from further afield? It influence, yeah, but we spoke about this last time, you know. At this time, I'm now spending a lot of time in Europe. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I've already got the bug for fishing in Europe, and I think we discussed why, yeah, yeah. you know, the freedom, the adventure, the lack of anglers, all of those reasons. So I'm already, like, buzzing about European fishing as opposed to busy syndicate lakes in England and stuff. Maybe, I don't think so. I think this come in later years, mm. but there would have been at some point uh, a conscious thing that we're doing a lot of business now in Europe. So it's only right and proper that we, um, not appease, but don't just fucking make films in Essex when actually our market's much bigger. It's that classic, and I think it's one of your things, that classic, why don't anyone film up north? It's been a stigma in, in the UK for years, and you, I still get lads going, you never film up north. I know there has been that stigma. I think that's been broken a lot now. So, yeah, for us, it was just like, yeah, let's go and have an adventure in Europe, certainly for that first episode. Yeah. It, I remember in later years, like me talking with Kev about plans and stuff and him going... Yeah, but come on, Alan, there's no point in going to Outer Mongolia because we don't do any business in Outer Mongolia. And, and he was right, you know, and I've been, over the years when planning these urban bank shoots, had to be conscious about territories and getting a return. Because I say again, guys, like, none of us were employed to make beautiful carp fishing films. No. We've, we're trying to, you know, sell some gear and stuff. But, and But on that same topic, and this is me looking from an external perspective, not within being employed by Nash a lot of the Nash content over the years, bar probably those first three um, urban banks which we talked about, doesn't really have a great deal of stripped down sort of commercial, this is the rig, this is a size two, this, do you know what I mean? It is yeah. very, it's very much, the gear is being looked at in an aspirational manner, it's being used, but the video inspires people and by proxy, they might go and buy some scope rods. Yeah. But it's never it's never really over-commercialised, I don't think. And, like. and this is the, you know, this is where I've got no experience, no qualifications mm. in marketing, and I'm just kind of finding my feet on a daily basis with it and discussing with the people that work. What is the right and wrong way, yeah. Hassan? I don't know. What I do know is if you... If I turn up at a venue, whether that's urban, rural, syndicate, pay lake, whatever, and I proceed to preach to people about use this, use this, use this, use this, use this, I don't think it's going to go down very well. No. You know, And I've done enough shop days yeah. standing not behind a computer screen making a film where I can see in their eyes, I can see their reaction. I know what excites people. I know what excites me. I know what makes people go, wow. Um, and I know the... I know the huge benefit of educating people rightly because it's what you believe, it's what you know, not chatting bullshit like because it's what I think I should be teaching. Mm. I've only, I've just always been quite honest in terms of this is what I use, um, but also conscious that you can overdo that where people will just look at you. I see it, I, I don't see it at shop days, but maybe I have in the past or maybe I'm conscious of what people, if I stand there and tell everyone, you know, you need to, you've got to buy this. There's only seven of them left on the shelf. Go and buy them now. People, some people are naive enough to just go, yep, whatever he says, I'm going to go and buy it. Mm. But a lot of those people will go, what a tosser. Like, who is this bloke? He's fucking been in the industry five minutes. What does he know? And what it does, in my opinion, is create a massive knock-on negative effect. And I've always kind of worked on the basis of, I just want people to like Nash. Mm because of who we are. And this has all come from Kev, you know. He's always said to me, don't write if you've got nothing good to write about. Don't write just to plug something. But if you have got something good to say and it involves a product, or then absolutely make sure you mention it. Mm. You know, which is why, it, just taking one example, I'll always bang on about Armalink. 
I will bang on about it until someone puts in front of me a better hook link. And that's not because I want to sell it. I need to sell it. It's because I genuinely believe it's fucking epic. You know, same with Citrus. You know, it's a fine line, bro. You know, from me doing a job, me and a team selling gear off the back of a film or people watching it and getting a really bad taste in their mouth, Mm. which could prevent future sales thereafter. You know, it's a difficult one. I think in terms of how it was marketed, indirectly <laughs> responsibility of yours, or even not not even a conscious decision, it is very, uh, very genuine, very clever, and and it worked because it was very you. Like a lot of other videos, were trying to maybe be quite compartmentalized, break things down, and, and quite product based. Um, I remember looking at various other companies, and this was being different. So it, it, that was another sort of string to its bow. But one thing that I am going to admit to, and this is a stark admission, mate. So you can't have me for this. I'll run to the toilet or something after this. So I don't get beat up. I remember taking the job here and in the back of the old warehouse, you've got all your gear, haven't you, that you just lay out. And you were like, yeah, yeah, go and go and get um, whatever you want, like whatever you need from there. I think I needed some leads or whatever it was. And I remember going over and thinking, hmm, does he actually use like all of this? I went through all that stuff, mate, and there is shed loads of it and there isn't, anything genuinely like from another company or from anyone else and i thought no like no. fair play yeah. at that I, point I you're just, like i'm yeah like yeah. people will go he's changing shit like no that. genuine yeah, no, i'm genuine yeah he's i genuine. can, I can like, vouch for that i yeah. was i'd have to say i was i wasn't surprised because i know you but i was like pleasantly reassured by just seeing i was like this yeah, yeah he practices what he preaches. yeah that, and i think that's it mate i practice what i preach I'm not proclaiming to be a rig expert. Therefore, you're not going to see the rig I created last night because I'm desperate to create a new rig to show you. You're not yeah. going to see it. Um, I've learned I'm definitely not a bait expert. Yeah. So I'm going to rely on Gary and Max Hendry that are bait experts to put in my hand the best pop-up. Do you know, Asan, I haven't rolled a pop-up for probably getting on for 10 years. Yeah. You know, whereas I tried, what the fuck do I know about rolling pop-ups? Do I need to roll pop-ups? No. Like, I'll just get the best pot of citrus and use them. So that's just me, you know, in yeah. later years, whenever, you know, I become a better angler and stuff and I, maybe I'm on a specific water that I need the edge of having a unique pop-up that I might. But at the moment, I really put myself into the bracket of, to a degree, the mass market, I'm fishing on limited time. Um, and I just feel, you know, I, I haven't used freezer baits for, yeah, I, yeah. I haven't used them for years, but I thought, I, you know, back when I was trying to be a car pangler, oh, you had to use freezer when you needed a cork ball pop up, get that hinge out there. You know, all of these things that, that are synonymous with yeah. being a car pangler, fishing so far up, putting a bucket of gear over the top, using a bait. Bar. And now where I'm at with my angling now is I just try and tell people what mm. I actually genuinely do, not what I think as a car pangler I should be telling them just this is what i do and it catches me a few fish right it's caught you quite a few mate and in reference yeah. to that you can see it in the, these early episodes i think we're only on like well what is urban bank seven well we're moving on to in bristol and already you can see that sort of development with regards to to sort of the series mate and um, reference in Eurobank seven yeah bristol bristol jo- jordan, jordan Dix. jordan i love him mate. he's a lovely bloke mate. A i've, I've bloke, met him mate. a few times but y- your relationship with him is it just true? you know it was beyond before this he yeah. was already a consultant for us um he runs a very successful tackle shop with his father and his brother mm. um get on really well with him and uh that whole episode he can take the full credit yeah he can take the full credit because you know, it wasn't documented in the film, rightly or wrongly, but, you know, I'm documenting it now, and I've said it many times before in articles and stuff. We caught those fish out of the docks all because of Jordan Dix. Yeah. Like, basically, he had put the graft in beforehand, which, you know, make no bones about this. That is a low-stock venue, yeah. really low-stock. And if me and Jordan had just turned up there blind, would we have caught possibly mm. the chances very low though yeah we turned up we did one night and we caught and that was de- all down to jordan's work p- pre that you know and i've done exactly the same in lots of my angling over the years yeah. um talked about the river chelmer before and stuff and other venues and stuff if you put the graft in beforehand, even with mine and tom's campaign when we very first found that lake and that 
all of the success from those sessions was down to the work before we actually fished, whether that be raking the swim, pre-baiting, observing the fish. And Jord, in this instance, he'd put the graft in beforehand. So yeah, yeah. he nicked one. We basically had two pods. He had three rods on his pre-baited area. I think I had two rods on his pre-baited. Basically, it was just off the wall. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, there was no specific spot. It was just he was regularly going down there and putting a little bit of bait in, which... On that point, you know, that word pre-bait, and especially mm. people like Jordan, when he's got a tackle shop, he gets this unlimited bait. I've worked for a company. <laughs> pre-baiting does not mean putting in yeah. copious. It just means regular. It means Jordan would have had to have driven from his house two, three times a week, half an hour or whatever, to go there to put a handful in, yeah. you know, to then drive back. That's the hard work in it. It's having the motivation and drive to keep going and doing it, you know. Um, so yeah, I basically, I think just one rod fished a choddy. So you basically had this main drag, like the proper yeah. basin itself. I've just sort of slammed a choddy about halfway out into this thing, thinking it's like a bonus rod kind of thing, you know, in and out. none of the other rods are out there. Fuck me, it went, you know. <laughs> but still, I'm giving him all the credit for it. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Even though it was no, it was 30 yards of whatever away from this pre-baited area, they could have been coming there to have a look or whatever. But yeah, my bite actually came out in, in the mid channel. Yeah. Again, I think it was a pineapple pop out. I can't remember. But if you remember last time I talked about that Belgium canal where the shop yeah. day, the yeah, fishery yeah. roadshow, and I've just gone up on this bit of canal, flicked out some pineapple choddies. And so yeah, it was a tactic that had done me well on a number of sessions. And, and this particular one, yeah, the, the truth is, again, this has been told, but basically that fish... It really stitched me up, man. Um, we were sleeping. It's a blitz intake. Problem with pod fishing. Unless you can lock that pod down, you've got to fish quite loose clutches. And the fish is basically kited round, not one boat, not two boats. It had done about a dozen boats. Oh, wow. And then wrapped itself up round the prop. Um, desperately wanted to land it. Hate pulling for a break anyway. So I was going to go and recover my rig, worst case scenario. There was these really intense signs. I remember them on the lamp everywhere with these intense signs. If you get caught swimming, CCTV, it's a thousand pound on the spot <laughs> fine. And I think a number of people have died, Hassan. You no know? way. Yeah, I think so, Matt. I think basically they're coming out kick out time like yeah. you've referenced and um, they're having a swim or whatever and people did sadly lose their life. So they were really strict at the Bristol Council on no swimming. I've kind of looked at this. There's no one about. It's five o'clock in the morning or something. First light. So I've swam. Do you know about this? No. Yeah, so I've swam out onto this boat, like just with my pants on. It must have been freezing. No, it was quite warm. It was the summer. Well, it was cold, but it was the summer. And I remember like, this is fucking mad thinking about it. But the boats are obviously moored up, but they're not like static. No. So I'm like on these boats and I'm climbing from boat to boat to boat and they're all rocking like this. And I'm thinking, if I wake someone up now and they look out their window, they're just going to see this skinny little man. Like, <laughs> this guy's Weirdo. Nuts. Anyway, I've managed to get all the way to the boat, like where the line is. And um, I took a net with me. Did I take a... Yeah, I took a net with me. I, anyway, I've untangled it or whatever, and I've netted my carp. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. you've got... But we couldn't show this. Yeah. You know, where, where I talk about how honest we've been, Yeah, we really have tried to be genuinely honest. But in this instance, it was, you know, it, it just... To I save, didn't know I, that at all. Yeah, mate. I didn't want the £1,000 fine, and I didn't want to set a bad example, which I do enough anyway. But we decided in this instance not to show that, that scenario. But that's what happened. And I remember swimming back across the river, climbing up this set of ladders with, with the prize and that, yeah. Wow. But I'll say again, it, a lot of it, uh, the bulk of it goes down to George's massive efforts pre, yeah. pre me turning up. Incredible venue though. No? Absolutely epic. You know, so much, you know, just the fact that we went out in a little boat and found an original Banksy, you know, yeah. that's cool shit, man. Well, it was for me anyway. And then we found that little box. I can't remember the name. Yeah, of that's it, with, right. With yeah. the thing in it. I actually found one of them just before Christmas. I've only ever seen, found two in my life and found another one before Christmas. Um, but it's Bristol, mate. You know, Did if you, you like drum and bass, is it know, is it a big oh, drum and bass? Fuck it, in the in the world, mate, it's renowned it? in the world. Yeah, I, you basically you'd have London, yeah, then Bristol. Really? Yeah. So if you like, if you live in Canada but you like drum and bass, you know, you know exactly what Bristol is. Basically, it's renowned across the world. For how its, how is that, mate? I don't know. It's just big party scene. Really? They're very culture driven there. You know, it's a really cool city. Um, and yeah, just I've never personally spent anywhere near enough time there. It'd be one of those that I'd love to live there for a few years to really yeah. embrace the street carnivals and the bars and the, they're just into their music. You know, some oh, of the bless. best, 
you know, Ronnie Size, for example. You've heard of Ronnie Size. Yeah, I've heard yeah. of Ronnie Size. So you've, yeah. you came from there, I'd, and yeah. it's mil- hundreds of good artists that have come out of Bristol. So it's just a cool place. Bristol. I was with a cool lad, with George, with the boys, with, with, I don't think so. Winston's probably left at this point. That's probably worth pointing out, maybe, I think, or he might so have how, done the how edit. how did that chapter end then? Uh, really badly. Oh, really? Yeah, really badly. I'll, I'll always feel bad myself. It just didn't play out. Um, it didn't work out too well at the end. Um, and yeah, we bid bid our farewells. He's gone on to do great things. Um, I miss him a lot. Yeah. But it's, Not it's, in touch at all? No. No. No, it ended that badly. Right. Kind of okay. thing. Um, I'd love to get back in touch, but I don't know if the, the damage is done, so to mm. speak. Um, it was just a chapter and then the close of that chapter. Um, I don't know if I've got regrets, maybe... Um, you always have regrets when you forget the employee. I lost a friend. Yeah, you mate. Know, it's more so, than an employee. Oh yeah, yeah. Mu- much, then, much, much more. So I lost. A, we lost a, an employee. Well, they're kind of replaceable, you know. And not, we proved that. But yeah, but not maybe Winston was f- a unique in that he was the Don, you know. But I'm. I wasn't that bothered, you know. I, we talked about it last time. The everyone's yeah. replaceable, but a friend. Yeah, of course they're replaceable, but they they mean a bit more. It's awkward. Yeah, it's funny. I was only speaking to to Lee about it earlier. Like in business, it's and we talked about it with Chloe and that. It's difficult when you start mixing business, that classic business with pleasure. It, it's awkward, you know. And, and I and you know Matt worked here for a number of years. Matt doesn't work here now, you know. Reedy worked here for best part of ten years. He don't work here now. And I'm really lucky in, in both those instances that we've stayed incredibly close. So much so, in fact, if you take Reedy, for example, I talk to him so much. Bearing in mind, he worked opposite me. Yeah. I talk to him so much more now that he doesn't work at Nash than when he did. Yeah. You know, and we've got a much better relationship now. Yeah. So anyway, digressing. But yeah, the Winston thing, it, I think around this time was no more. And right. That Ollie. show, Ollie and Carl. Yeah. So Carl's on board now. Carl's on board, yeah. The Carl boys. had been on board for, for a year or two previously, but yeah. And yeah, we went to the Park Lake and, you know, really don't want to get into it because anyone watching this will have seen it. So It's like, it's an iconic scene, isn't it? If you think about like Urban Banks, that is the one, mate. Did you ever feel about cutting it out of the video? No. No? No, because it goes back to the... Yeah. Now, I'm contradicting myself here because we cut out the bit of me swimming across the yeah, river. It's but different though, isn't it? Sort of, you know. And, you know, maybe if we'd have gone out and done that this year and I'd have swam across the river, we may well have kept it in, yeah. you know. It was just a decision at the time. Um, I probably just didn't want the £1,000 fine, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, no, which I would have right. probably got, you know, if yeah. we'd have made a video public with me swimming. But, um, yeah, we no, we decided to keep it in. What were you like when she came? Like yeah, it, we saw it. You can't. I can't. Like you saw it, so I wasn't any different to that. Yeah, you know, um, she was pretty full on, mate. Wasn't she, she was full on. Yeah, you know, and in, in, you know, I don't want to get on the line, mate. You crossed the line, yeah, and the line, you know, <laughs> the line was there yeah. for a reason, and you know, this wasn't spoke about in the in the film and that, but basically, you had a park lake. We have a beautiful area of green around yeah. it. You know, classic park lake scenario. Beautiful. Used by many, picnicking, families, et cetera, et cetera. But at the back end of that park, like where the island was, instead of the sort of lake going lake, path, beautiful green grass, it went lake, path, and then brick wall. Yeah. And this brick wall, what this did was it meant that the gap between the water's edge and this brick wall was approximately two metres. And what the council had asked was, can you not fish past the line where the brick wall is because if you do fish there you are going to obstruct or block wheelchair access mums with push chairs etc etc really really sensible don't fish the other side of the line because if you do for example set a chair up there or a seat box or whatever a rod pod whatever it may be now i'm conscious of this yeah, I understand why they've put this in place yeah but me walking the other side of the line with a sawn off like it, to me, there was no big deal. Like, she used that line to her advantage to have an argument or a dispute or a discussion. You know, her reasoning for me going behind the line was very different to why that line had actually been put there. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But obviously, I think un- underneath it all, her her 
not tolerance, but her views maybe towards anglers were a bit different to uh, to, to sort of let mm-hmm. that go. But yeah, another story, mate. But as an episode, brilliant, because you had different venues. You yeah, had yeah. That whole aspect and also the link with Jord was nice, mate, because you could yeah. see it play out that you were tight mates yeah. and, and, it, and everything else. And then moving on from Bristol... Eurobanks seven point not Eurobanks I've done that classic error Urban Banks seven point five mate yeah so this is I'm gonna say like some sort of ADHD crazy episode where you flip from like Birmingham Manchester Holland there's everything in there mate so the concept of this is different yeah. it's a bit more road trippy it's a bit more fragmented was it a case of you just had a number of things going on and compiling it or was that always going to be the way I can't remember. I, I, I think, I want to say it was a failed shoot. I okay. think, i.e., I think the concept was go to Manchester in the middle of winter <laughs> at the hardest time of the years, go to Salford. That was the concept, I think. Is this really led at this time or so no? like what? There was a number of things going oh, I'm really struggling to remember, but there, there was a number of things going on. Ollie was with me. Yeah. But then Ollie had to leave. Okay. So we went there to fish there. But why did I go there? Why there? You went Again, to a few places. In the episode, you went to obviously quite a few places around. I think, did we go to the Moorings first? Yeah, you might have. I so think, we blanked there. I love yeah. that venue, by the way. You know, I think I've done three nights over the years there. Blanked every time. Mm. Um, but I really like that. That's one of them ones that I just like it there. You've got the big pub and... Yeah. Um, so yeah, we blanked there, blanked there, then I blanked at the key. So that's two nights blanking. And then I think it was probably in the run up to the show yeah, or, or possibly to the, Northern, to the Northern Angling show. So I needed to still be up there. So I think I stayed for another night and that's when Reedy filmed me, yeah. just me and Reedy. And there just wasn't enough there to make an episode even though that night with Reedy I caught those two mega 20 pound yeah. like, I still look back on those captures like, they're that's a, mint that they? proper mint mate that's another fond memory you know yeah, um, yeah it was with Reedy we fished perfect. so it just weren't enough there weren't an episode uh, if you know what I mean Ollie had gone home so we didn't have a decent cameraman yeah um, hadn't caught the first two nights so it was a failed shoot yeah basically. yeah fair play so rather than can all the footage we me Winston and Ollie again Mixed decided um so Winston must have still been there on that basis actually. oh right okay. yeah I'm now thinking about this he must have edited uh this. Bristol episode oh, okay yeah so yeah, he would have yeah. done the Bristol episode uh anyway that's what matter um and yeah, it didn't work out along with that me and Ollie had obviously been to Holland as you yeah. referenced and um we did a little bit of filming there, but that definitely wouldn't have been a planned shoot. That would have been like we were there working, going to probably Hangle Sport U Trek. Yeah, that's right. Um, and yeah, it was a basically like, let's put another episode out. We don't actually have an official start to finish episode. Let's accrue yeah. some various bits. And we called it 7.5 and yeah, failed shoot, I suppose. We sort like, of insinuated this before. You coming up north to film content, mm-hmm. even now, a lot of tackle companies don't come up north or yeah. have never been up north. North, they would qualify as Midlands. Manchester, obviously, in terms of the population, not only does that sort of endear yourself, but it is trickier to catch up north. You've rocked up in February. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, why, why, do you think, why do you think that is? Is it just because the fishing's harder or just because, I don't know, yeah, mate? Of, like Hassan, like, there's a lot of good fishing down here. So if you wanted a to lot. make a fishing film, you know, you've got to look at, like, where's the best place to go? Do you go to mm. Middlesbrough to make a fishing film or do you go to Oxfordshire to make a fishing <laughs> film or Essex? or, or where? So that's probably why. Um, there was definitely uh, issues in terms of, you know, as a company, we sell fishing gear to people in Middlesbrough and they weren't feeling very loved. I'm yeah. using Middlesbrough as just one example. You know, like you say, yeah, that yeah. northern part of the country, I was very conscious of this and um, that was probably something. I think the main reason I went there, though, was, again, inspiration. Um, by this yeah. point, you know, the, the series has got a bit of momentum. People have warmed to it. They like it. And I remember, I think I pretty much remember the shot, and it was George Phillips. There was a shot of George. I can't remember if it was a bus shot or, or whatever. Anyway, George had made contact, or I'd somehow got hold of him, or he'd right. got hold of me, and we were talking over email, or whatever it may be. And George was like, you need to come. Come yeah. and have a go. And... Um, 
yeah, we went and, and, and fished there and that. Uh, I'm just thinking that might have even been a year previous because I don't remember right? it being filmed. I think I might have... I gone might have just before. gone down and seen the boys down there, yeah. you know, gone and met George, gone and met Wes and some of the other locals with Ollie and then gone back to our hotel. I don't, I can't quite remember, but mm. basically I formed a relationship with George and Wes that at the time were fishing here and their captures inspired me. Yeah. The venue inspired me um, enough to want to go there and try and film it. So we did, middle of February, whenever it was, adjustable zigs <laughs> in fucking a really <laughs> low stocked bit of water. Yeah. Um, absolutely ridiculous. But yeah, there was other things that needed to be done. So Reedy had paid an extortionate amount of money for an external video production company to produce a promotional oh, film yeah. Yeah, for the right. Northern Angling Show. So I had to do that. Then I had to have a meeting, ironically, in one of these new buildings. So I had to do that. And it, it's just typical life i'm like looking like how can i get the most out of today mm. <laughs> let's make an urban banks film let's shoot a magazine feature let's have a meeting let's do this and just it, it all fell together and and that's what happened um and obviously yeah. geographically logistically cost wise you're up here it's a fair old trek you're up in manchester it's a fair old trek from essex mate so as you say you've got to try and maximize it haven't yeah you? what i wasn't going to be doing was going to film on salford keys driving home going back up to do something for reedy reedy needed me to be in this yeah, film basically yeah. and then coming back and then going to have a meeting with the people in what is that place? jeremy carl media. you were at media oh, no I went, yeah, yeah. I, I did bump into the jeremy yeah no, media city That's so right. i wasn't going to go up three times as you suggest you know it was a case of cramming it all in and, and getting a job done but yeah that was that was that show. What's the people like, Manchester guys, mate? Uh, amazing. Absolutely amazing. Now, George and Wes, we're mega friends now mm. still. We've done some, had some great parties with them. And, and you stuff. said before, earlier in this very pod, that there are, you said hello to people in the morning, you did whatever. There, and this is me coming from the Midlands, now living Manchester way. They're the people in Manchester. You get that yeah, all yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was freaked out mate when I first went up there because I thought people were trying to like talk to me to put me up to nip my wallet or something yeah, do you know nah, what I mean because you don't normally get genuine. it do you it's yeah. genuine and I really like that you know this is probably wrong but to be fair like we are more arrogant down south you know if you talk about just carp fishing we've got the best fisheries we've got the biggest carp we're the better fishermen you know well that's not actually the case at all you know and we're all British or we're all whatever. We're yeah. all carp fishermen or carp anglers. Yeah. We're all the same, male, female, whatever, you know. We're all equal in that respect. We all go to, to try and catch carp. Um, as human beings, yeah, those people, the further up you go. I've mm. seen it with the shop days. Yeah. You know, uh, I, this is... I can think back to some shop days I've done down south where I've kind of finished them at the end of the day and not really gone home with a warm feeling inside me of happiness and content. I just felt like no one really gave a fuck what I said. You know, who is he? What does he know? You know, I've just come off the car park or I've just, you know, yeah, yeah. done my lifetimes angling at, in Reading and, you know, who is this kid? Whereas the further up north I've gone, the more receptive people are maybe just to being kind and that makes you put you at ease and I've certainly enjoyed those shop days more and in the case of filming whether that be meeting other anglers mm. or meeting the general public yeah you get a much nicer reception um, the further up the country I, you go I think the fact that you went up there filmed and sort of embraced that with regards to knowing how difficult it may be etc yeah. I think that definitely spoke volumes for you i remember not booking you but arranging with you to do some shop dates when i worked for a retailer up north and the buzz around somebody coming up yeah. to spend some time even if it was just we did lock-ins i think in the yeah. in the evening yeah. even just to do like three or four hours in the evening the fact that you were up there yeah. that endears you so much because Otherwise, there isn't that much with regards yeah. to content or, or people being up that far north. So, yeah. so fair play to you, mate. Even if it did work out as a bit of a failed shoot, you know. It, it, this one kind of goes on to Liverpool, but you know, one of the best shop days I've ever done. In certainly in terms of making me feel welcome, mm. would have been Taskers. Yeah, yeah. So we're now in in Liverpool. Um, and yeah, I think the first one, again, I, I could be slightly exaggerating it. I could be under exaggerating it or underestimating it. But I think there was something like 800 people turned up. Jeez. They had people on the door with a clicker. It was like 150 in the shop at any one time. And there's just constantly queues all day. I was the only person in there. I think Ollie was with me. 
he might not have been to be fair and yeah I, I just remember thinking after that wow you lot up here like really show the love you know so for that I'll be forever grateful mm. to to the likes of the people from Manchester and Liverpool for basically welcoming me with with open arms um if you remember back to the the, the nasty comments we read out there was the incident where someone said stay out of Manchester you yeah you know, um but I think that's the minority. I think most people really did op welcome me with open arms. And yeah. I made some great friends, you know, yep. up in those parts of the world. So. Happy yeah. days. Um, and then, number eight, was Cardiff. This yep. is 2015, I've got written down here. So we are moving into relatively sort of um, like recent times, if you like. Cardiff, another area, sometimes Wales, that doesn't get potentially that much attention. Yep. But... Um, for you, that how was Cardiff? Because I've been there. It's a beautiful place. It's quite a multicultural <coughs> like. I didn't scene. see any of it. Did you know? No, I don't think I've still to this day ever been to Cardiff. No. You know, my experience of Cardiff is the Wharf, which yeah. is the venue we went to. Um, again, inspired um, yeah. Andrew Reese, Jason Massey. Um, they were fishing this venue called the Wharf. Um, they got in touch. Um, I'd seen their pictures in Carp Talk again. Yeah, and. Um, yeah, I remember doing a, it was Carp Society Junior Fishing. I've been pretty lucky, if you could call it that. But over the years, I've never been an instructor. I've always right. attended year on year, but they've always called on my services to um, do like a talk with all the, the, the students, the pupils, the young, young anglers. So that was always my responsibility. And I was always the floater angler. So I basically yeah, yeah. had them for slots over each of the days where I'd have to float a fish with them. And, but I was never beholden to being in a peg during the night, if that makes sense. Whereas the, the normal format is there'll be an instructor and one or two students. I was never that person. So anyway, I was doing one of these Carp Society events. Literally the moment I think it had got dark um, and the float fishing was over and all the kids were now back in their swims, I drove from Letchlade to the wharf. Right. Met with Reece Steve, he was already fishing. Um, got the rods out, done the night with him. He caught a lovely common. I caught a fish called the Mutant um, um, and self-filmed it a little bit. Yeah. Packed up, went straight back to Horseshoe and carried on wow. doing float fishing with the kids. And that was my first time of meeting Andrew properly and okay. seeing the wharf. Um, and then, so there was no, at that point, it was a possible venue to go and film in Urban Banks, but it wasn't like the start. It was just like, hit record, done a little bit of filming. And then, yeah, when I got back and spoke to Al, um, it was like, mate, it's sick, mega venue. It's got some big fish in here. Mm. Um, and yeah, then we went back properly. Um, again, it must have been Winston. Winston and Al. I think it was Win and Al. Could have been just Al. Can't remember. Yeah. That's, it doesn't matter so much. But yeah, we went back and, and this time we actually did two nights there. Yeah, but a big um, difference to sort of your, it's more, I don't know, it sort of seemed a bit of a hybrid between a park lake and like a syndicate, no? Because it was pretty... At, at the time when I filmed there, yeah. it was still very much park lake-esque in terms right. of it wasn't really controlled by anyone it was a bit more of a fr i might be ta totally speaking out apologize to anyone if this is completely wrong information but i got the impression it was more of a, a locals venue they okay. kind of policed it themselves they looked after it since then it's gone on to become more of a syndicate you know yeah, i think yeah. there might even be a waiting list for example now and stuff and they've stocked it with some some yeah. mega fish and that but definitely when i went there i felt anyway it was more of we're the locals. We love carp fishing. We're looking after this place. We're going to do some litter picking. We're mm. going to like make sure they were looking. It was looking after itself because of good lads there and stuff. And yeah. again, made to feel very welcome. The venue was really interesting in terms of it was a basin. Yeah. But like really natural. You know, you could have taken the ecosystem, for example, and dropped it in the Cotswolds mm. and it would have been like perfect because it was so full of naturals and weed and you know the stock were in the stock of fish was incredible it wasn't though it was in cardiff and it was concrete yeah. place and so it's really quite unique and that excited me you know that it wasn't a silted up park lake or uh yeah it was it was different and i recall the episode you went and also off to the sort of canal network I had to, rough. I yeah had to. the fishing was so difficult yeah. um i had to I had to really put some graft in just to get that bite. You know, I can't remember what happened. I think I might have lost one, then Ollie lost yeah, one. Yeah. Um and then I, I and then I had one 
and then I had to do some like missions missions basically because that's how it works you know mm. like we talked about it already you need to try and deliver carp and um, I'm on borrow time um, so I went in search of them um, looking back you know the old hindsight's a wonderful thing Massey give us a right good ass kick in he really showed us how it's done and how to fish it and I think again I'm, I'm making so much of this up as I go along but the venue is full of naturals. Yeah. They the boys were using a lot of particles. I remember that first session with Andrew, you know, he was spotting out, you know, particle. And I just think that as much as those fish did know what a boil he was, they were probably sustaining their their diet more on on bloodworms and mm. snails and stuff and, and feeding on those naturals. Just the time of the year when I was there, I think I probably put my eggs too much in one basket in terms of boily fishing. On another day, Hassan, it might have been the one, do you know what I mean? But yeah. Um, yeah, it didn't particularly angle very well. Scraped a few bites, two bites, and it was enough to put a film together anyway. Uh, Jason was a star of the show, you know, he mm. fished well um, and uh, and he caught a few fish, so he, he kept it, you know, he kept the pace of the film going in terms of he was catching and stuff. So. But, it's not, but it's also nice to see somebody who's not a local maybe addressing things in a different way like maybe if you'd have just sat there and, and fished the same way and not caught anything and not gone off in little missions it would have been it would have been a different piece it wouldn't have been urban banks really, yeah it, it was exciting i remember at the time it, it was exciting yeah I moved a few times fish were quite visual you know they would show and stuff um if i'd have stayed there for seven days it could have been a very different film if i'd have gone at a different time but that's that's the way it is yeah. Nice, mate. And then we're going to move on to Urban Banks 9. And this star of the show, sort of obviously yourself and Alfie. Now, Alfie Russell, we talked about before and how he came to be part of the team, yep. if you like, in Nash. At this stage, he's relatively young. He's caught loads of, I remember seeing him, Phenomenal. loads of unbelievable fish yep. out of like Park Lakes in London, yep. East London, where he is. Yep. So for you, you look like you're pretty much led in terms of where to go by Alf because yep. he's the local boy. Yep. As an experience, as sort of getting to know him, you knew him by then, but had you experienced that fishing before or was that like literally straight yeah, no, in on? No, no, no. Well, I'd fished with Alfie a number of times yeah. in London as well. Right, okay. Um, so no, it, it was... It was it was twofold. One, he's the... It's like going to Bristol, but not doing doing it with that Jordan. Yeah. You know, so it's like going to the wharf in Cardiff, but not doing it with Andrew and Jason. Yeah. You know, you kind of... You'd go with an expert, you yeah. know. So I went with Alf. Uh, also, it was a profile raising exercise in terms of look Alf let's put you on this episode of Urban Banks because you are the future kind of thing um, so there was a, a multitude of reasons but yeah none more so than he knew you know he yeah. knew the venues but not all of them you know he hadn't fished Burgess Park for example yeah. which was one of the ones we fished um, yeah just very fond of the lad yeah. and I'm sure he'd say the same about me we were great friends we are great friends yeah know? I was going to say still in co absolutely still tight now. absolutely yeah. Yeah. Alfie you know like maybe myself maybe like a lot of people growing up um, you know it's not easy becoming going yeah. from boy to man or however you want to dress it up you know, he, he's a young man who's had to find his feet in the world and um, you know he's made decisions uh, one of those was to, to leave Nash yeah um, does that make me dislike Alf? No, <laughs> not in the slightest. Was it difficult like, that or not? Um, not really. No, you know, but, uh, you know. Again, not getting into the nitty gritty yeah, yeah. of it. Um, it was the right time for for it to happen, and um, we've kept in touch. He's got a lovely little baby now, yeah, and yeah. he's got a little place together with the missus, and um, just like lots of friends, I don't get anywhere near enough time to to spend yeah. him. I keep threatening Alf that I'm gonna come and see you. We're going to have a proper chat about and a catch up and that and and one day we will you know and yeah. we keep in touch on, on message and stuff and occasionally might chat on the phone but yeah very fond of him. What impressed you about him as an angler? Not just this episode of, of um, Urban Banks. I mean, preceding that as well. Just the drive. Yeah. You know, it goes back to the you know making the effort, going out, putting the bait in, hunting them down, searching them, and just I was very honest last time with regards to him. Um, Carl and Alex, how mm. raw their fishing was in terms of it's dead simple. If you find them, you know, and you use a rig or you stalk it or how yeah, they can be caught that way. And he really rekindled that in me. Yeah. Um, whereas I'd got sucked into maybe even to a degree brainwashed into wanting to be a 
textbook carp angler. These young lads that were significantly younger than me, they made me remember what carp fishing could be like. So, mm. yeah. I think I remember also, and this is back to the episode, it's quite an active episode. There's a bloke who's dropped his phone in the canal that yep. you fished out. Yep. That was mad. <laughs> you know, he he knew Alfie knew him like Oh, he knew him. Oh yeah, yeah. Him oh, and so Alfie. he wasn't complete random. No, he was um I think he was an angler, you know, and right. I can't remember what happened. Did he get out, he got his phone out to show us a fish or something? And yeah, it's just gone in the drink. Um so I've got that out for him. Um And didn't Carl end up swimming? Carl went he for did, a swim. It, yeah. Um yeah, Carl bless him, <laughs> like um I I was pretty frustrated this day. We, yeah. Basically, a good lesson here. Um, we'd done our two nights. We blanked a night. Then we'd done a night on the Tidal River. And Carl can take the credit for this, to be fair. Basically, me and Alfred fished through the night. We thought well mm -hmm. in an area that we believed there would be carp passing through. Don't know if Alfie had ever actually fished. I think he'd only fished further upstream. Could be wrong. But anyway, we've got up in the morning and blanked. Now it's like shit. Now we're in shit, basically, because yeah. we're in deep now, but we've not really caught anything. I think I'd fish solid bags and maybe Alf had done this. I can't quite remember, but anyway, the tide was low, but it was coming back in, and there was a sort of offshoot to our left, and me and Kyle were the only ones up. Alfie and Ollie were still sleeping, and... These fish have kind of appeared now into this sort of fresh rising water. So they're up on this sort of shallower, silty area. And Carl's just like that, bro, just fucking smash a choddy out there. Like, and I've like, it wouldn't be my first tactic on a rising river because of the, the movement, movement of the yeah. river and the presentation and stuff. But I didn't really have anything to lose. So I've quickly like prepared a choddy in there. And yeah, caught three, like basically yeah, on man. the bounce. So it was... It was really Carl sort of suggesting maybe you should just sling a choddy out there that I did that we caught some. Anyway, so we managed to catch some. Pre that, go back a day, we went to look at this park. This is mm. the this is what I was gonna say to you, Hassan. We went to look at this park and me and Alfie had walked around it and we found a shitload of fish. Alfie had <laughs> been there before, not fished it. I've yeah. never even seen the place. We did the the right thing as anglers. We've scouted out the area, again in terms of parking and in terms of lie of the land and stuff. So we weren't turning up completely blind. And anyway, we found all these fish. And I remember looking at Alf, looking at all the other anglers around the venue, which was very classic, you know. Blazing hot sunny day, everyone's fishing on the bottom. <laughs> all the fish are sitting on the top, yeah. everyone's got bite alarms out. Just that classic, what are you lot all doing? Yeah. Like, anyway, so me and Alf looked at each other, and I'll never forget, we kind of, the glint in both of our eyes, where we were just both relatively good floater anglers, and we've got a fucking load of rice pellet in the motor, load of slicker floaters. We're going to cane them. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah. going to cane them. Like, yeah. actually cane them. So I remember, like, actually even doing that night, thinking... Whatever happens, we've got this park lake tomorrow. Yeah, banker. You know, we're gonna, it's a banker, mate. That's exactly the word I'm looking for. It's a banker. And I remember getting there. I remember through the night, I always tell people about this, how as anglers we're fantastic painters and we paint this image of how it's going to go, how, <laughs> what swim we're going to go in, how we're going to set our rods up, what rigs we're going to use. And in the build-up to a session, you illustrate in your mind how it's going to play out. Well, this particular session with Alfie and I, we weren't going to have enough nets. There weren't going to be enough SD cards <laughs> to record it. We were going to catch so many fish that, you know, we're going to have to bring an extra. That's how it was, this painting was in my head. So when we arrived there, I remember the drive across London to get to this venue, all I was, I was just sitting there praying, like, just please let that area, let us be able mm. to get into those swims and that. And I remember, like, pulling myself up onto these railings, looking, fuck me, it was free, Hassan. Yeah, there was other people fishing, but this bit where all those fish were was free. And I remember, like, tell it, me and Alfie just rushing in there, bullying a china shop, like, getting into these two swims that commanded this bit of water. And he floated fished, I fished uh, over depth zigs mm. and was spotting, like, cloud over the top of them and stuff. And yeah, for like four odd hours, we caught nothing. We never saw a carp. And it was Ollie, he got bored. He walked a bit further down. And when I say a bit further down, I mean like 20, 30 metres down from where right. the pet. And he come back up, he's like, lads, you need to uh, come and have a look. And we've walked down there and there's just carp everywhere. And someone had been down and thrown out loads of like pita breads and patties. And bre right. there was just bread all over the surface of the water. And there was just carp like nailing yeah. it. And that's a really important lesson that even after doing it now for 
in excess of 30 years, I still find, I'm still guilty sometimes of painting this picture in my head of what rig I'm going to use, what bait I'm going to use, where, and most importantly, where I'm going to fish and not addressing the situation on the day. Because if Alfie and I had got there, instead of rushing in like all cavalier and excited and that, if we'd have just done what we'd done the day previously and that was one lap, it was all it would have took. It would have took 10 minutes, 15 minutes max we could have not wasted that four or five hours blanking. So yeah, yeah I, maybe you do it sometimes. I, I'm still guilty of it. I do all the time. You think I'm going to get in that swim. If I can get yeah. in that swim, you know, and I'm going to, I'm going to use this setup and that, but you know, it's like, you need to read the water on the day. Yeah. You need to try and find them on the day. And then you need to really look at that situation and ascertain, you know, how much bait am I going to use? Lots, little traps, are they up in the water? Do I need to zig fish? Do I, you know, all of these things that even I'm holding my hands up, I still sometimes get sucked into a preconceived idea and that. So I'm yeah. a nightmare for it, mate. I yeah. I caught some last week, mate. I'm gonna go. I'm already in my head thinking that Oh, we've just I can't. There I, you go. Do you know what I mean? There you go. But I won't there you go. Okay, I won't. don't. Don't I won't. Don't. But I know that if I spend a few hours elsewhere and I haven't had a bite and I might yeah. have seen some signs, I will has, like drift back potentially to fish the same way. But yeah. fish You don't. know exactly what I'm talking about then. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's something that I think as carp anglers we're really guilty of. Uh, and I'm holding my hands up saying that even to this day I am. But yeah, London was cool. It was a great show. Um, did it with Alfie. Um, yeah, it was great. Yeah, mate. It looks like a... It looks like it, an interesting place. It looks very intense, mate, in terms of, like, the travel looks like... It's busy, mate, isn't it? it well, when you get into them cities, yeah. When you right. get into them big cities, it's it goes back to that original statement I made. You can have a tiny little park lake in a village that, because it's got a bench and a mm. bin and a rat and a tramp, it, it's urban, but that is at the other end of the scale. You know, when you're talking about London and Paris and these big cities, it's it's mental, absolutely mental. Yeah. yeah. Um, moving on to the next one. Now, this one is very different. So, I'm um, here. You, I know you've got Carl, um, Carl and Alex involved. Ollie's still there, but you've got a, a a sort of a newbie on camera competition winner. You've got Joe Gladys. It was, and you did a Park Lake special with mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. So, how was that meeting somebody and sort of integrating them into the world of a Park Lake fishing, but also being on camera and filming. Yeah, so this whole episode was purely done to raise money. We um, we raised uh, a load of dough for uh, some KHV research and one of the ways to... Yeah, I'd done a number of auctions and raffles to come and do a day's fishing with me, but one of the big prizes was not only could you come on a day's fishing with me, but we would shoot mm. an episode of Urban Banks and Joe, big ups, bro. Um, I still keep in touch with him. He paid a you could say extortionate amount of money. I can't remember exactly. I know you're going to, how much, how much? I'm not going to say that. <laughs> he paid a very, very amazing amount of money just to come and um, spend, uh, you know, the day. It was 24 hours or something. Yeah. Anyway, to come on an Urban Bank shoot. Um, you could argue it was not great in terms of, you know, Joe had never been on camera before and all yeah, of these tough. things. Me, I, Joe's fantastic, you know, yeah. off camera. He's a lovely lad, like, and he just wanted to, A, give something back. He was yeah. clearly on a good way. He used to be able to afford the donation he made. Um, and, yeah, he come along. Um, he weren't fantastic on camera. It's um, hard, mate. It's fucking hard, you know, especially when you've got, like, big lenses pointing at you and that. But for me, how did it play out on the day or in the shoot? It was brilliant, you know. Yeah. I was with a lad, um and he had asked lots of good questions and I basically endeavoured to give him as much information I could about catching carp from these kind of venues. Yeah. I think at this point, I wanted to talk to you. I wanted to get definitely on the pod. You've done a lot, and there's more to come, of Urban Banks's, but a lot of them around Park Lake environments. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people, I don't want to say COVID and lockdown and all that, but at the moment, people can fish locally only, yeah. days only. Yeah. And that lends itself, if you're in the locality of a Park Lake, to go and get some fishing rather yeah. than not. So for you, over the course of sort of your development, your fishing on Park Lakes, what what are the key sort of factors and I know that that's a broad spectrum of things to consider, but if you were going to go and target a part like tomorrow, mm -hmm. and you hadn't done it before, mm -hmm. talk me through it. The first thing to understand is it's not any different to if I was going to go to a local day ticket lake or I was going to go to my syndicate. So it's number one, 
where are the fish? We've mm. touched on it already. Yeah. Where are those fish going to be? Now, at this time of the year, they ain't going to give themselves away easily. They're not, you know. If they do, you're on for a winner, i.e. if you start seeing some shows, brilliant. You know, they're not going to be showing here and then swimming there and there and there and there and there. This time of the year when it's cold, if you see them show, wow, you know, what a touch. If you don't see them show and you're down at a park lake, it goes back to the cover thing. Where are they going to be most comfortable? Something we've spoke about earlier today, um, the particular one I'm thinking of, Rochford, and I'm sure a number are like this, they might have a stream coming into them. Mm. If they have, that could be very, very interesting. It certainly is for the fish at Rochford. Um, just that influx of fresh water, bringing fresh food in. Potentially that water could be half a degree warmer, so they're com more comfortable there. Um, so yeah, cover, influx of water, um, bird feeding areas it's your classic you know even in the winter you, you'll often hear people say in the winter if you can just keep the bait going in if you can just keep a little bit of bait going in it keeps them moving it keeps them looking for it so in the case of a bird feeding area if their birds are getting fed because they get fed all year yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. it doesn't get to winter and mums stay no more bird feeding <laughs> kids we'll wait for spring to come round you know yeah. people are still going down and putting that food in for the birds and stuff um depth pop maybe uh, mm. and maybe the weather you know if it was a lovely sunny day something we've also discussed earlier why wouldn't those fish be in the shallows why wouldn't they be you know seeking out the extra bit of warmth or that half a degree or degree warmer by moving into the shallows it's it's a really difficult question to, yeah. to give you a solid comfort you know i would say two plus two is four but you saying what's the all park lakes are so different. They might be really deep. They might be low stock. They might be mega yeah. stock. They might be... But yeah, just if, if you're going to go out this time of the year and you're going to fish your, your local park lake, ascertain, if you don't know anything about it, how many fish are in there? You know, are you fishing for yeah. definitely one maybe by... Or is there a few carp in there that, you know... Um, Try and get some local information in mm. terms of other anglers that fish there. Is there a Facebook group or, or an Instagram page about it to try and build up some information... Um, maybe if you can pre your session, have a wander around it in the day, maybe you'll see that show that will give you the bit of information for when the session comes round. And then on the day itself, try and keep your eyes open um, just for, for any signs. Could be coloured water, it could be bubbles, it could be a show. Um, maybe going back to what we discussed earlier about not sitting it out mm. all day in one spot. If it hasn't worked in a couple of hours, try somewhere else. Um, yeah. O overall though let's not beat about the bush it's fucking difficult at this time of the year yeah yeah totally you know, it is difficult so um tackle that yeah. is what i'm going to ask you because mm -hmm. what would you say obviously the whole scope essential sort of theory behind it but for you if you're going in park lake what would you take with you let's go rochford as a prime sort of classic park so lake rochford jungle. i would take my sawn offs yeah be purely because my biggest cast is going to be like 50 yards um maximum 50 yards so mm. i don't really need anything longer than that yes i could use nine footers yes i could use 12 footers but i would take the the shorter rods purely because of the trajectory of the lead there's one island in there sometimes if you can slam underneath some of those uh, not just overhangs but the undercut on the island itself um, I would only be able to do that cast with a six footer. Yeah. Anything longer, the lead's travelling up and then down, whereas the six footer on my knees with a good solid, I can get that lead to travel. Yeah. Very much parallel with the water. Um, taking Rochford, the fish go to just shy of 30 pounds. So I'd probably use the two pound test curve um, if they were, you know, all 20 pound plus, then I'd probably use the threes, you know. Um, there's not much in it in terms of, you know, I just like those softer two pounds when you've got small fish, yeah. with small works, and, you know, it just gives you a little bit more. Um, it's, they're more forgiving when you're playing small carp that are scatty underneath yeah, yeah, the rod yeah. tip, you know. Um, yeah. Any other tackle questions? You might need a pod because of the concrete banks, yeah. stage stands. Um, it's always worth taking cable ties. Um Back in the day, I've been guilty of this, hold my hands up, using tape, but then you sometimes rip. You, If you look at the wharf, for example, yeah. it's dreadful, you know, the amount of anglers that have taped their buzz bars on and then it pulls the the paint, paint off. off yeah. So, yeah, always try and use cable ties because they can be cut off at the end. Um, washers and screws and a drill. Um, there's been many, many instances over the years where you can't get pegs in. Yeah. And just a drill um, with a washer and a screw, you can keep your bivvy. Lifesaver, yeah. Um, other than that, mate, it's like... Bait? 
bait, you go white, you know, unless they've been truly hammered, I always, you've always got to think, what are these carp feeding on more than anything else? Um, in, in many instances, it'll be bread. So mm. a little bread stick, um, I like to mix some bread, liquidized bread, white citrus, little white citrus pop up. It's never done me, yeah. done me too bad. At this time of the year, the white baits as well, you've got really gloomy skies, yeah, you yeah. know, and they, I just believe that white, stands out the best over those sort of silty park lake bottoms forgetting the bread thing you know yeah, i yeah. just think as a visual thing for the carpet this time of the year the, their senses are at an all-time low uh, you've got citrus pumping out 30 odd different levels of uh, attraction and aminos and vitamins and all, all the goodness that goes into it and you've got something very visual and yeah choddy maybe a helicopter set up because of the seal if i didn't use a choddy uh, it's so hard to say these yeah, are yeah. the the golden rules, but yeah, that's kind of would be my starting point. And for you, just generally, when you're fishing these type of venues, and generally fishing at all, you don't strike me like you said before as a very riggy like person. It's all yeah. about location and yeah. and that sort of secondary. So for you, do you have I don't know favorite bottom bait presentation? No, nah. you just use the same one yeah, every time. Yeah, I just I'm not that. I haven't got to that point in my angling. I tried to be there and, and it just went tits up because I didn't understand everything. Or yeah, yeah. And now I'm at such a point in my fishing that... <clears throat> I it re <laughs> This is getting really long, I'm sure. Sorry, everyone. But basically, I'm thinking, am I feeding tight on a spot? Yeah. Am I using... Let's take the park lay thing. Have I mashed bread up or liquidized bread with some spot clad? Have I made a mix that I'm throwing in that's going to keep the fish on an area moving around very slowly on quite a tight spot or have I spread boily fish? Mm. Have I taken boilies and dotted them around the area? If I've taken some gear and thrown it in the edge next to the bird feeding area and it's fluttered down and sat on the bottom, then I will fish a short rig. Yeah. Yeah, because the fish are moving very short distances between feeding. In fact, they're not really moving at all. They're just, their mouths are in the bottom, in the silt, and they're just moving around. I want them to pick up my rig which for the last five or six years has been a slip D. Um, I want them to pick it up and I want them to immediately come into contact with the lead and, and get hooked. Or am I fishing over a dot of citrus? So citrus air, citrus air, citrus air, citrus air. In that instance, the rig will be significantly longer than fishing over a bit of gear. Um, or it'll be a choddy that's sliding. Mm. And my thought process is there coming there sucking the bait in and then they're probably coming up to a degree to travel across to the next bait and then sucking it in so yeah more length in my hook bait the first scenario i explained where i'm lowering a rig onto a spot for example where they're feeding tightly more often than not it will be a bottom bait it won't be ultra critically balanced it might be a pop-up but it certainly won't be one that yeah. can yeah, can fly back because I don't want the bait to be moved and wafted by the fish's suck and blow or their pecs or their tail pattern. Whereas over a, a dot of, of boilies, a spread of boilies, the bait is very critically balanced. You know, I literally want it to to sink incredibly slowly. So when they do come to one, when they do maybe tip and go down to suck it up and they, I want it fly, yeah, flying yeah. back in. And yeah, for, for the last, what, three years now, it's been a uh, the classic Ronnie rig. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Could yeah. be a multi-rig, it could be a whatever rig, you know. I don't get too hung up in it at no. this point in my angling anyway. I'd like to think in years to come when I'm better that I'll think more about my rigs, you know, and think. But at, na at the moment, I just, what I've learned is when I tried to, it just confused me more and I was investing too much time worrying about that and not about making sure there was fish in front of me so yeah but then also the nature of of the fishing is you don't you don't need to because you're getting the results you're catching fish mate. yeah you're not getting like i don't know aborted takes or, no. or one bleeps or, yeah. or things where you might think i've got a, t a tanker it, yeah. it's going it's going yeah. there's a fish on the bank yeah. uh, place a good insight that i often think i should probably visit some park lakes myself mate it gets me uh gets me thinking about <coughs> it mate but we'll see um so picking up back on to, to sort of the um, the Urban Banks episode, we've now come up to Liverpool and obviously hosting you is, uh, is Craig. Craig. What Stand a bloke. Up. What a bloke. What yeah. an artist, mate. Talent, mate. Literally Rorous, incredible. Rorous talent. And he's a family man and he yeah. works hard and I've got a lot of admiration for him. Yeah, he's, a, he's an absolute all-round yeah. top bloke. Now, Liverpool, for you, 
did you have much of a sort of an insight or heard much of reputation around the old Park Lake scene up there before? Not really, no more no. so than it. But but I was warned by anyone I might have mentioned it to in passing. Don't do it. You know, it's Liverpool. You're not going to have wheels on your car. They'll nick all yeah. your gear. In there, there was a lot of that in the in the run up to it. So much so that I decided I would just do one night. Really? Yeah, so up until now, we might have done two yeah. nights. or It was decided on that shoot because I'd never been to Liverpool, certainly never fished there or anything like that. And I, I was kind of maybe dubious or sceptical about how much truth there might be in in what was said that, yeah, we would just do the the, the night. Um, it couldn't have been further from the truth. Yeah. You know, I'd done that first day with, with Craig, um, caught some lovely fish. Um, we met half a dozen people. It's a busy park. Yeah. Um, half a dozen anglers. And they were delighted to, to see me and Ollie and they wanted a picture, but it was under the promise that they wouldn't tell anyone else. Yeah. Wasted breath because they were straight on the phone. All oh over my it. God, you're not going to believe this. And yeah, the following day, um, we were descended upon by phenomenal numbers. You know, at some point there would have been like probably 30, <laughs> maybe as many as 40 lads in the swim with me. Yeah. Um, and it was, I just loved it. It was so good. Like really good shoot. I remember on that second day, about 11 o'clock midweek, this, like there was 20 lads in front of me and they were all like, show us this rig and tell us about yeah. this. And it was basically like, I'm, we were trying to film an episode of Vern Banks, but it was also like the ultimate shop day. Cause I'm like, yeah, show. it was fantastic. I loved it. But I do remember just stopping halfway through explaining something and going, hang on a minute. What the fuck are you lot even doing here? You know, they were all oldish, 16 plus, 16 to 35. It's 11 o'clock. Ain't you got jobs? And they've all just looked at me like, jobs? No. <laughs> no. No way. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they're all like dripping in in fucking Armani and North Face. Oh, they're Jesus. all like, yeah. And I'm just thinking, you lot live in a different world to me because yeah. midweek, 11 o'clock, where I come from, everyone's sitting in an office or like, not these boys. Nah. Nah, different world. Different, different line different of work, world. mate. I different think. line of work. And they were, I've kept in touch with lots of them. Have you? Oh, mate, they're so nice, man. Yeah. And, and when I went to Taskers, they all come to see me. I go to the Northern English show. They were, and yeah, they're just a really great bunch. And it was the complete opposite to what everyone told me it would be like. Yeah. At the end of the, the second day, some people turned up in the park that made me and Ollie feel a little bit uneasy. There was one particular lad earlier on in the day that... I had a bit of a dispute with, um, I can't even remember what it was over, filming, you know, what? I don't want you filming here. You know, I've got like 40 lads absolutely buzzing their tits off that we've come to film here and then one lad who weren't that happy mm. and then later on in the day, we were due to leave anyway, a few other people turned up that, I don't even know to this day if they were anglers or not, but okay. it was a different vibe, you know, and we were due to leave anyway and I wouldn't have wanted to have done a night there. Honest. That would have been one that we discussed earlier where you just move. I, I would have gone. Yeah. You yeah. Know, they, you've got to make that call on that. And uh, I would have made that call then that we weren't going to to stay a second night. But yeah, also in that trip, I was introduced via Craig to uh, Pablo and Nick. Yeah. Um, and again, stayed very good friends with them. We actually went and filmed some more in Liverpool. It never became an episode, but I had two further cracking days with those lads. Um, fishing the Sankey Canal. Sankey, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I caught a really nice common out of there and then done like five more park lakes in Liverpool. This is on a, a shoot that's never appeared. Um, yeah, that particular shoot, uh, at the end of it all, Ollie had to go and do something, but I ended up dropping down into Chester and fished uh, yeah. a basin. It, sadly, we it never made the film. I was with Lou Porter. Oh, yeah. And Yeomans. Uh, I can't remember why, but I've ended up going there and I've had like five really nice commons out of this basin, which would have been fantastic to include in that film, but for whatever reason, it didn't. didn't. I can't remember why, but yeah, that was that was really cool. And yeah, that was my first sort of experience of, of Liverpool and really made me fall in love with the, the, the anglers that are up there. Yeah, mate, they're a, they're a good bunch, mate. Yeah. As you say, reputation, I remember hearing it and thinking, oh, I don't want to be here. But if you go up there... Yeah. Especially daytime, mate. It's lovely, isn't yeah. it? Um, and then probably on to a very different, yeah, Urban Banks, which was the underwater, mate. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the most recent one that's come out. At this point, like you said there, 
with Liverpool, you can see that it is a movement, yeah? Especially with the amount of people that are turning up, the amount of interest around not only you as an individual Nash tackle, but also this urban fishing, park lakes, etc. Why... Why the thought of taking it underwater, mate? So at this point, you're as you say, mate, I'm now aware of, of what's... Yeah. I, I'm aware that we've created something that hasn't been done before, but more importantly, it's been done in the realest and purest sense, and it is actually what a lot of people are doing in their own angling. You know, you can go and book a venue and have swim shut off or you can have a venue pre-baited. I'm not suggesting I've ever done any of this. Or even if I was on an exclusive syndicate or, you know, I've made films at Redmar, for example, yeah. where we had the whole venue to ourselves. There was no other... How real is that? How many other people are going to get Redmar to themselves for two days? You know, I can't think of many I've done it, but I suppose why people warmed to it so much was they were like, fucking hell, mate, he's fishing the same park lake type of park lake i'm fishing this is like real and that that's why i think it became so successful mm. forget the fact that we had fantastic editors on it and you know there was just i think the biggest reason for its success was the people watching it could resonate with what was going on and they were just going that's just what i do like i'm never gonna get a welly ticket i'm never gonna do have you know He's doing what I do, you know, and that's where I think a lot of the love came from and stuff. Um, why then completely go off on a mad tangent? Yeah. Truthfully, because I was bored myself. I was, yeah. Re yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm at a point now where I'm going, what, I've got to go to another park lake and show another choddy with another white citrus pop-up on. So I'm like clutch. I wouldn't say clutching at straws. I'm now really like racking my brains. How can I bring a different dimension in? If you go back to the Stratford-upon-Avon. yeah. I know, guys, let's do it on a push bike. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> That's yeah. what it was like. It was like, that was the dimension. And now cutting all the way to here, I'm like, well, I'm running out of fucking ideas. You <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. you can, you know, places like Bristol, you can rely on the docks to yeah. be the, the big thing in it and that. But I was getting to a point now where it was like, shit, like, anyway. So it just con coincided with a chap called Andrew, cracking bloke, done loads of work for us up at Royston and stuff. He, he brought dive teams up there, removed snags and that. Mm. He'd mentioned it a few times. He's like, why don't we try something? And, you know, rather than going and staying, you know, putting cameras on a gin clear gravel pit, for example, I was like, well, can we try and do it somewhere urban? And, yeah, he backed me. He taught me to dive. He basically chucked me in Nashi's swimming pool. I'd never dived before. I think I dived once at, like, in Scouts or something, in yeah. A, yeah, for, like, 15 minutes or something. The most basic of basic. I could try dive. Yeah, I've never yeah. done anything. Like, anyway, we'd done, like, a safety lesson. He stuck me in the swimming pool at Kev's. I'd done it. Felt really at ease. He said one of the hardest things is people just get nervous, but I was mm. so at ease, like... And then literally we got out of the pool, had a coffee. He's like, do you want to get in the lake? And I was like, yeah, fucking right, let's go. And I got in the lake and I really struggled. Yeah. Um, I lasted about 15 minutes and I had to do whatever signal it was, but I, I needed to get out and yeah. Was that just because of... Cold, yeah, bruv, like I was so cold and I hadn't, I didn't have a sealed uh, neck thing and I didn't have a seal on my gloves. So basically the cold got into me and anyway, we got Ooh. out and then we went to the venue in question, I'd done one dive there pre um, the actual filming and then we just cracked on. And it was very real, again, I can't stress it enough. We turned up, I went diving, we put the cameras in. The next day we went back out, we put the cameras in and I started fishing. And we were just so lucky that at the end of that day, we, yeah. got, we got a bite on camera. Yeah, Really lucky, you know, because we could have, it could have been days, you know, to get that. We didn't have days. If it didn't happen within that time frame, we weren't... It it's not going to happen. Yeah, it weren't, it weren't yeah. shoot kind of thing. Diving in that part, like, scary? No, again, I felt so at ease. I'm, I'm petrified of height. I'm not so petrified now. I'm slowly getting a little bit better, but I'm very bad with heights, Hassan. Are you? Yeah, yeah, really. I'm, I can't climb the trees and stuff like that. I just don't like it. Okay. Um, but put me out on a boat in big waves, you know, on a big bit of, you know, inland sea... And, just happy fearless Fear, really? which is a, possibly a bad thing yeah. you know and it goes back to this wearing life jackets and which when i'm in that situation i do always put a life jacket on but i feel really at ease yeah at, on the water and and the diving i just it it just felt good <laughs> <laughs> it felt good mate to be like with the fishes like i like diving 
I've been lucky to sort of scuba dive at sea, clear waters, lovely abroad. I did it in a, like a gravel pit, mate, and I just found it scary, mate. Yeah, it's dark, yeah. like there's no vis. It's cold, like just a completely different world. But fair play F- for you watching underwater um, the situation, if you like. Did it fry your head? Was it a different... In what way did it sort of change the dimension of fishing? <laughs> Not really. But it may well have done if I'd have sat there for days or yeah. weeks on end. But it was all... It all happened so quickly, you know. What did I draw from it? Um, the biggest thing that... I was aware of this. But when... It's not until you actually see it that you really appreciate it. That Basically, we had two or three cameras. And I put bait on these cameras and the bait consisted of, I took a bait box down with me, a little bait box, and in it was a lot of flake, a mm. little bit of maybe pellet or hemp. I can't quite recall. Two or three whole boilies, but it was basically that bit mix, that grubbing around mix, you know. And in that was lots of liquid. Um, we do like a liquid bait soak where yeah. if you don't shake the bottle and you look at it, you can see in the bottom of the bottle is all the food-based content and then the top is is the oil-based content. If you give it a good shake, it mixes it well. But basically, if you do a tank test, I should always show people at shop days this, if you take that bottle and you pour it into a tank, you see that bottom liquid, the weight of it, it just falls to the bottom. And obviously the oil-based stuff at the top is is pinging up and, and creating attraction through the water column and pulling fish down there. I knew this because Gary had sort of told me and Kev and I knew the effectiveness of it. I knew the effectiveness of flake and I always use the example, if you take, for example, what I had in that bait box and it fitted in my hand, if you took the exact same equivalent in weight or monetary terms in just round balls of boilies, if I'd have gone out and dived on that spot put the rig there and then put the boilies there because of the bream and stuff that were present in abundance in less than a few minutes of the bream arriving on the spot, they would have eaten all the boilies. I was fishing like 24 mil cultured hook baits mm. topped with a snowman, you know, big hook baits because I knew the bream were there. Never actually got picked up by a bream because of these giant hook baits, but they would have cleared me out of freebies. Yeah. What actually happened was I was putting in this exactly the same quantity, but in flaked boily with this liquid most importantly the bream would come in they were absolutely it took them hours i think around four hours four five hours wow. to, to to clear it up and then there was slowly it settled down again and you could see the spot and you could still see my rig and stuff now to the human eye you, honestly you look at it and you go absolutely nothing left yeah but what then happened just on the cusp of darkness it happened on two of the cameras but the one we got basically the carp eventually turned up And they came in on that spot and they just started feeding on gravel. Yeah. Because impregnated into that gravel was the dust from the flake, but more importantly, the liquids that had, you know, soaked into that substrate and stuff or or into the crevices of that substrate. And it was enough to keep them there, to get to a hook bait, to get the bite on camera. And yeah, I was aware of it, but when you see it, you know, firsthand how a carp comes in on the spot where to the human eye, there's no food left there whatsoever but starts to feed, that's when you realise the power of, you know, mm. something like that liquid bait soak or the fact that don't just use whole boilies because they can disappear and your rig might not have been as effective as it should have been, therefore you didn't get a pickup. The longer you can keep them there feeding, the more chance you've got that it's, you know, you're going to get a pickup and stuff. So that was a really cool observation to see firsthand rather than just thinking it, you know, to actually see it firsthand. That brings us pretty much up to date in terms of where the series is. Now, overall, for you, if I say to you, Urban Banks, what is the first thing that comes to mind, mate? Yeah, a lot of fun, a lot of good memories, good people, cool locations. Yeah. Urban Banks. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anywhere that you'd like to do one that potentially isn't um, already in the pipeline or whatever? Truthfully, yeah. I'd like to not do them anymore. Would you? Yeah, that's the truth. That's Why is that? Um, because I'm old now. I'm old. Yeah, no. I wanted I wanted Alfie to take the baton. Did you? Yeah, of course. That was always the plan, you know. And now, you know, and he's got to prove it. I want Jacob to take the baton because he deserves to, you know. Yeah. And, and I don't want to do it anymore, you know. I still love fishing park lakes, and but 
my life's changed a bit. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. In terms of I've got bigger filming. But if you go back to like those episodes, way back, you know, I didn't have huge filming yeah. obligations, and and now I do have, and now I've got family, and I touched on this in a, in a recent interview. It's a lot easier, Hassan, for me to make a family fishing video with my family than it is to make an episode of Urban Banks. Um, yeah, I'm just not that I ever was cool but i'm gonna become less and less cool to this n a new generation you know yeah um there's lots of urban places i'd like to go yeah yeah and uh, maybe i will carry on making some episodes of urban banks you know we tried you know we went out last year and shot another one in london jacob featured in it mm. if for no other reason very much like the alfie london episode it was like to again try and push his profile up yeah. and, and to make people you know, take note of this young man, Jacob and stuff. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. It's weird. I just, you know, it's a bit like the Eurobanks thing. Why did I want that to end? Nothing lasts forever. You um, just, but nothing also. should last forever. I feel I've just been honest with you. Like yeah. I had to bring in underwater cameras and stuff because I felt the dimension wasn't as strong as it was in those early episodes. And I was going to say that organically, the whole series has been quite organic in its development. And it seems that towards this latter part, there's a forced. little bit of a. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it feels so forced now. So much so that, you know, I, to a degree, you, yeah, I'll use the word I failed on this recent, well, recent just, you know, in the autumn we went and filmed London Urban Banks 2. I felt I failed in terms of I didn't catch what I wanted. And now I've got this huge burden on me that I'm now going angling and I don't want to do it, you know. So mm. I, And that's not, you know, we touched on this before. My angling, I want to be because I want to do it. I want to fish the places I want to fish and the styles I want to fish. And I now feel beholden to Urban Banks because I want to complete this episode. And I'm now fishing somewhere I don't really want to be fishing. And I'm not enjoying it a lot, you know. And that's wrong. Mm. I don't think anyone should go fishing because, you know, to catch, get likes on Instagram or to catch, you know, that's not, my, that's my philosophy anyway. Go fishing to enjoy it. And I'm finding myself not now because of my failed <laughs> angling efforts it's back in the autumn. But um, it's not failed until you stop though, mate. You still can No, going. no. But it, it's like anything, like nothing lasts forever. And you yeah. should, if you can pass it on to someone else, that would be lovely, you know, for someone like Jacob to, to carry it on to, you know, people more his age and yeah, stuff yeah. you know but we'll see who knows he's a good little angler mate he's, yeah he's uh, shit he's up mate boy, yeah he? he's great he's good great. on camera as well to yep. be fair fair play to you yeah. jacob um one thing that we are going to briefly gloss over mate towards the end of um of this uh talk is Yora banks yeah we talked about it a little bit i don't want to go into too much depth because you've done a podcast series one yep. with dan and alf and ollie yeah all about sort of highlights and everything yeah, else. Yeah, but yeah. obviously, during this sort of development of, of Urban Banks, Eurobanks has come into play. Yeah. For you, Eurobanks being a, a secondary sort of series, mate, the right decision? Or would you... Oh, yeah, 100%. Because it, it freed us up from Urban. Yeah. It meant just going on an adventure in Europe, which, you know, means you can be a, a lot more... You, you've got a lot more options in terms of venues. Yeah. Um, I got to do it with Ollie. Wouldn't wish a better person to do it with. So we've had like the most ridiculous trips away together. And yeah, but again, that came to an end, you know, and we, we won't talk about it like we said, but. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But for you, Europe, Euro banks, how do you, how do you quantify that in your head in terms of, do you feel done or do you feel not done? Like, I, I don't know, because I look at it and think, in two years' time, I know now you feel like you've taken it to the end, but in two years' time, let's say there's not necessarily somebody else that can take on the baton, if you like, mm -hmm. would you want to go back and do another one? Maybe, Mark? maybe. I've got, I've got one venue I'd love to do. Now, that could be a standalone film, mm. or it could be like, like the Bled scenario. It is like Bled to me, this particular place, in terms of it makes me feel... I've fished it a few times, but it makes me very happy being there like and it needs to have a film made at it now that could be part of a, a future big Eurobanks film where it could be a standalone film um I've got another concept in my head without going into too much detail which could be Eurobanks in terms of it's a slightly different format but 
I don't know, Hassan. I don't mm. know. But what I do know is, Jesus Christ, did we not time it right? In terms of if, we, if we'd have planned to do a number seven, there was not any number seven happen. And that, that wasn't crystal ball predicting the future. That was just, it fell well in terms of, or it ended well in terms of everything that's going on. Yeah, mate, totally. Me and Ollie, we, again, we've, we, yeah, we're going to carry on making films together. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course, yeah. standalone pieces, and, um, and they'll be, they will be mega. Yeah. Uh, a consideration that I think about when I think about Eurobanks, right, is organisation, mate. Mm -hmm. Because, yes, I think the early episode you might have been a little short on maybe bits and pieces that you needed. But if you look at the spectrum of venues, yeah. the spectrum of different types of fishing that you covered yeah. in, let's say, Eurobanks free onwards, yeah. you mm -hmm. must. how do you organise that, mate? A lot of planning beforehand, a lot of venue research. Um yeah, discussing with Ollie, you know, what situations we might find ourselves in, what we need. And then it kind of, Ollie will be the first to admit, he's not particularly that well organised. Um, and so it all falls in my lap, you know, it, to the point where the last one, and maybe even the one before that, I just said to Ollie, can you just make sure you've got your trainers and your clothes sorted and just leave me to sort everything else? Jesus. You know, so I did, you know, so I made sure there was double of everything. Um, A, because again, I want it to be, the best in terms of the product features and stuff, the mm. most up-to-date product, and I'm better placed to organise that than Ollie in terms of I live here, that so to speak. Um, and yeah, I just yeah, it, it was a, it was a powerful marketing video for us, and I wanted it to be the best it possibly could. So yeah, I'd like make sure Ollie had all braid spools, mono spools, fluoro spools, and I'd have exactly the same. We had like double kit basically. Um, Mad. You yeah. do well to get it in that van, mate. Yeah, and then you've got the Tetris job of packing it and, and stuff like that. And, and yeah, it, you've got to be organised on those kind of trips. You really have to be. Yeah. And even then, you know, you you know, we played on it a little bit, but it's very, very true. Even then, at least every 48 hours, I'd strip the van. Yeah. At least. Because, yeah, if you, you're rushing in that and things fall out of place or whatever and you're throwing gear back in to quickly get to the next venue so it's like a reset button it's like right strip the van load it all back up right I'm good to go again yeah. you know, it helped me you know helped me in my angling be making sure that van was very well organised and, and stuff you mesh quite nicely with him doing the driving as well mate yeah 100% that was absolutely, but he's a machine he's a machine I can he's drive very good at driving very good you know, and, you know, he'll be the first to admit he's had to, on the odd occasion, call for my help. Yeah. Ow, I can't do any more. But, you know, it's, it, it, that's where, the, that's where, that's like any relationship, you yeah. know. People have strengths and, and weaknesses and stuff. And one of Ollie's strengths is absolutely, you know, being able to, to drive very, very well. Yeah. I'm not very good at it. I'll admit it. I drive too slow um, and I become tired very, very quickly yeah. because it's just boring for me. Whereas give me like all the SD cards to organise into folders and file them all away or prepare rigs or, or whatever. Um, we worked well as a team, very so you're well. You're not driving, you're tired. You're tired, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, What strikes me is that over the course of all that series, over the course of both series actually, you haven't had that many failures. Now, I don't know what you put that down to, but I think if I went and fished... In those short pockets of time, especially on Eurobanks, you're rocking up to a, a new venue in a different country for hours. <coughs> I don't think I'd have had anywhere near that success. And the one stark thing, and I won't name the angler, but I do remember, because it was locked down, that the last um, Eurobank 6 was released. And I remember waiting for it to come live. Because I was oh, it's going to save my lockdown there. We can't go fishing. <laughs> I remember reading an article by a... Um, a high-profile carp angler. It said something on the lines of, like, um, targets for the year was, like, to catch um, five different fish in five different countries. And then I remember watching Eurobanks thinking, sports have caught, like, 15 <laughs> fish from, tw from, like, 15 countries in, like, 10 days. Yeah. It's just obscene, mate. Yeah. A, did you feel the, the sort of pressure um, consistently throughout all those chapters? How did you deal with that? And B... How, what do you put that success down to, mate? Because not everybody can pull a unicorn out of the hat every time they go out, do you know what I mean? Yeah, taking a, a step back, they haven't always gone to plan, Hassan, have they? You know, um, 
if I take Eurobank six, for example, I did that two nights or three nights with Mark Hoffman. Yeah. This is disaster, you could argue. Um, Montenegro, obviously, Skidar, drove yeah. the whole way there, you know, to Skidar, disaster. So, no, it isn't, you know, always um, a success. Um, when we get to some of these venues, I'm catching a three-pound common, you know, so one could argue it's still... But it's just what I like and Ollie likes. It's like what we thrive on is challenging ourselves and pushing ourselves and also it goes back to that earlier podcast the putting of the jigsaw pieces together quickly so get there look ascertain walk around see fish find fish quickly what rig are we going to get them on yeah. a grabbing round mix we're going to get them on a single pop-up can i catch them on a slow sinking ball of maggots and it's just it's a real buzz you know doing it like that um and then we've always said like ollie and i Again, rightly or wrongly, you know, Kev, if if Kev was the boss of it, he would always say, nope, you're doing three venues in two weeks and you're going to stay it because that's what he wants to see. He yep. would rather see us stay there and not just work out, we discussed before about the corners and the frame. He'd like yeah. to see more of that picture formed and I'm sure a lot of other anglers would too. But it's what me and Ollie wanted to do and people have enjoyed it. Some people moaned about it. You know, you're not spending long enough at a venue and stuff like that. But um, no, I wouldn't say that every single venue we've gone to has been a resounding success. However, some of those venues have been a resounding success based on the amount of time we've been there for and, and stuff like that. I and think you just named two there. Skidar was obviously decimated anyway, so you can't really say that that's within your keeping. The Hoffman session, all right, wasn't a great session. But... In all that time, mate, that there's goes, been others. There's there, not been many. No, though, there's has not been there? many because because what it is is this is the other thing. It's complacent. It's being complacent. If I it, and I am guilty of this, and I, I definitely when I talk about that era where I might have been like brainwashed or wanting to be this carp angler, yeah. I actually thought back then. This is something I should point out. I actually thought back then that you can't go carp fishing unless you've got at least 24 hours. And ideally you need 48. That was my mentality. Right, okay. You know, and then going going over all thing, meeting Carl and Alex, like they're only going down the park for an hour and they're catching 40 pounders, do you know what I mean? On a bit of bread. So I quickly remembered that, you know, you don't need 48 hours to go carp fishing. And that's kind of just exaggerated in an episode of Urban Banks mm. where me and Ollie are buzzing off the fact that, you know, we've got limited time. We're going to use that time really, really wisely. We're going to fish really, really hard. Whereas if me and Ollie turned up, especially Ol, I guarantee you this, not, not that I'm saying he's lazy, but if Ol turned up at a venue and you had three days there, he would not be going hell for leather to catch one. He wouldn't. I <laughs> might still, yeah, yeah. but he wouldn't. And I don't blame him for that yeah. because I've been that guilty in the past of that. You know, you get to a venue, you've got three nights ahead of you, does it really matter if I make the wrong swim choice now? Now, I'll rectify it. The fish are going to come to me. I'm going to yeah. put bait out. They're going to come to me. Well, we all know that doesn't always work, Hassan, you know. If you turn up in the Czech Republic and you've got three hours to catch a carp, you know, me and Ollie will do everything in our power in that time frame to do everything we can to catch a carp. And mm. that's why I use that word complacent. If we turned up in the Czech Republic and we had three days... We would fish very differently. Yeah. We'd fish very differently. Yeah, nice. Um, for you, I'm going to say the um, the parties at the end, or the party at the end, there's been a party before as well, but your end of sort of Eurobanks party, mega, epic, all oh, you wanted ridiculous. it to be? Epic, 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 epic. You know, the party thing was... It was always mine and Ollie's treat. You know, people have always joked that, no, you're just going on holiday. Well, it ain't a holiday, what we've had to do, you know. So at the end of it all, we always treated ourselves by going and having a party. Um, and that was nothing more than that. And yeah. we just kind of featured it. It was a very short segment uh, at the end and stuff. Um, with regards to the last one, yeah, um, I knew it was going to be the last one. And um, I wanted to thank a number of people by celebrating together and bringing them all together and um it just couldn't have been any better than that and i speak on behalf of the 200 odd people that were in attendance that it was a really really special day and night yeah definitely it couldn't have gone any better you know it, 
to go back to that day now, oh man, I'd do anything. Would for you? Oh mate, Hassan, what, with everything that the world's gone through in the last, yeah, mate, to go sure. back to that one day now, to wake up, you know, on that lake with Ollie and that bike with the girls was bigger so as well, yeah that it, just that day just yeah. to relive that 24-hour period even though i went to bed before midnight and the party didn't finish till six o'clock the following morning yeah like waiting oh completely but that's me you know that's nothing new there is oh, it not I no 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 oh yeah because your your resolution was to be last man standing yeah that's yeah so that particular one i was in bed by midnight you know and uh, just that day <laughs> it was the day what it was yeah. it was everyone arriving it was everyone arriving and afterwards a few people had a dig at me. Samir, definitely one of them and a few people. You're a pussy owl, like you didn't even <laughs> last till. And I said, I remember rowing with Samir. I'm always forever having dispute. I said, Samir, do you know what, bro? Like, I didn't need to be there at three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I didn't need, I'd completed it when everyone had arrived. It was done. It's a bit like people say that classic. Uh, for me, it was just about the bite. The battle didn't mean anything. The picture didn't mean anything. And I very much felt that day mm. that my work was, you know, it, I'd achieved what I wanted to achieve when everyone had arrived. Yeah. You know, what went on after that, I was in bed, mate, s snoring my head off, like, <laughs> after two weeks on the road. And It's got to take it It was out, a special you know. day, man. Yeah, yeah. Really special. Big thank you to Reedy for um, holding the fort in my absence and, um, yeah, making it happen. Yeah. It looked mega, mate. Um, I can't, because of poor research, <laughs> tot up how many millions of views as a series Urban Banks and Eurobanks combined has, mate. But overall, when you... Not conceptualised it, because that's wrong, because you didn't. When it sort of took shape and formed... No idea. No idea. <laughs> no, no idea. I'm probably still thinking, is Kev right? Will everyone have a smart TV? I don't know, you know, let's just make a fishing film. No, no idea. Really? No idea. I remember Gaz doing an interview for Carpology, and he had some figures on Eurobanks of so many million and that. And Obviously. I remember sitting with him doing the interview thinking, fuck me, wow, that is, that is really cool. That is really, really cool. Like... I think as fishing goes in terms of just numbers of views, that's got to be up there with like the the very top of the tree, mate. It's just a ridiculous amount of amount of reach that's got both yeah, those series combined. Now you say it, like yeah, it's pretty cool. Very something cool, something to be proud of, you that's know. But I, you know, you're you're sitting here talking to me, Hassan. Don't forget Ollie. Yeah, it, as much as me, you know, and then you've got the likes of the video editors, Winston, Carl, Alex done a couple of edits, Dan, Dan on the latest yeah. one. Um, and then you've got the people on the ground, you know, the people we met, you know, it is a very much a taking Geo's terminal, tale of friendship, journey of friendship, um, which is why I wanted that big party at the end of it all yeah. to, to really, it symbolised everything about Eurobanks to me. You know, people from the outside look, well, they're just having a fucking massive party. It was much more than that. It was all those people coming there. All, um, loads of those had in some way, shape or form played a part in what you're referring to. And that is millions and millions and millions of views. Not me, not just me and Ollie, not just me, Ollie and an editor, but everyone that in some way, shape or form. Yeah. Yeah. Mate. It's both series, absolutely mega. What has been mega for me is these three parts on the podcast I will never forget. And talking about it now, we look, we always hark back to sort of cart fishing history that we look back at. This, for our future generation, will be cart fishing history, mate. And you have been fundamental in that, no doubt, in your own way, mate. So a lot to take pride from. And thank you for sharing it with me. I know these guys will thank you because it's already been so popular, mate. You're a legend, Blair. Thanks, Hassan. An absolute legend. Thank you, bro. Thank you all for watching. Thanks, guys. You will be back with another podcast. Not in this series, though, mate. Al, cheers, mate. Cheers, bro.